Father, why don't you lead us in prayer this morning, okay? Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your provident care for us and for our city. We ask that you guide the deliberations of this council, that they may rule with justice and wisdom. We ask that you continue to bless our city and all that we do for it. We ask this in faith. Amen. Y'all want to come help me do the pledge? They're doing pretty good on harmony, so I'm going to get them to sing the, the Star Spangled Banner now. Oh. All right, I'm gonna, let me see what I've got here. That's perfect timing. Why don't y'all just hang out here with me? Do you have anyone else that's coming up with you, or are you, are you handling it? You're handling it. I should have known. Okay. Let's, let's talk about a proclamation then. This is a group of young scholars who recently won an award or won a gold medal at a presentation. And this is called the Texas Research Institute of Young Scholars. Um, it's a really neat program that they do through the San Angelo Independent School District. Uh, I've, I've been involved in it as a parent and so forth for some years now. And, and these kids take on a project, do the research, then do a presentation uh, on that project. And this group has taken on texting and driving. And uh, part of our support for them is to put a, uh, a proclamation together for them and, uh, and to support their efforts. And so they'll tell you the rest of their story. But the proclamation, whereas no text is worth dying for, and whereas the purpose of the Arrive Alive campaign focuses heavily on education, adding fuel to our efforts to reverse this growing road safety problem, and whereas it's important that every driver understand the risks of such a dangerous behind-the-wheel activity, and we especially need to reach the newest generation of driver, who are the most prolific texters with real solutions. And whereas with texting drivers 23 times more likely to be in an accident, we must change attitudes, shift behaviors, and save lives. And whereas in order to make a sustained change, everyone must do his or her part to put an end to texting and driving. Now therefore I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of March as Arrive Alive, Don't Text and Drive Awareness Month. Now why March uh, in our rearview mirror? That's when they did their presentation. This is the first time we could get them up here to get this to get this proclamation read. So in San Angelo, Texas, we urge all citizens to take part in the spirit of this and pledge to never again text from behind the wheel of a moving vehicle. Are you all ready to present? Yes, okay. Do you want to get a picture with this?
Well, thank you City Council and Mayor Alvin New and City Manager for watching our presentation on texting while driving. We are the Arrive Alive Don't Text and Drive Tries Group. I'm Hannah Brown. I'm Drew Eisenbach. I'm Holly Esposito. I'm Brian Martinez. And I'm Emily Latoya. Global issue. Texting while driving is one of, one of the leading causes of automobile-related accidents, which often lead to injury or death. Hypothesis. If drivers would refrain from texting while driving, then fewer accidents would occur because they would not be distracted and would be focused on the road. Facts on texting while driving. Five seconds is the average time that a driver's eyes are off the road while texting. When you are traveling at 55 miles per hour, that is enough time to cover the length of a football field. 34% of teenagers who text while driving say they are used to multitasking. Brain power normally used to concentrate on driving safely decreases by 40% when you are texting. You are 23 more times likely to get in a car accident while texting. 39 out of the 50 states have already banned texting while driving. The age group with the greatest proportion of distracted drivers is the under 20. 34% of teenagers think nothing bad will happen to them if they are texting while driving. Distracted driving is the number one killer of American teenagers. 100,000 crashes a year involve people who are texting while driving. 77% of teens say that they've seen their parents texting while driving. Reaction time decreases by 35% when you are texting while driving. According to studies conducted by Virginia Tech University and Car and Driver Magazine, texting while driving is more dangerous than driving while intoxicated. Seeing for ourselves, while we were each out with our parents, we decided to take count of all of the drivers we saw texting. We had a combined total of 73 people. That is 73 potential wrecks, 73 potential deaths. Plan of action, school level. What we did for school level is class surveys, pledge for life contracts, parent pledges, carpool posters, morning show video, test simulator, and edgy fair goodie bags. City level, petition, teenage survey, and awareness week proposal to Mayor Alvin New. State level, we spoke with State Representative Drew Darby Secretary and State Representative Tom Craddock staff. We presented our project to State Representative Drew Darby and we submitted our petition to former State Speaker of the House, Representative Tom Craddock. School level, we reached out to our peers and parents by creating a poster message that spelled out, please don't text while driving. We each held up a poster by the carpool area where parents pick up their kids every day. Classroom surveys before and after the pledge. Before the pledge, over 50% of students have seen their parents texting while driving. 75% of students say that their parents text at stoplights. 50% of students say they have said something to their parents about it before. And over 90% of students still think that it's dangerous. After the pledge, only 10% of students said that they have seen their parents texting while driving. Three out of four parents continue to text at stoplights, 20% of students still have to say things to their parents, and over 90% still think that it's dangerous to text while driving. Classroom survey graph. As you can see by the graph, there is a significant decrease in the parents texting while driving after they sign the pledge. This is the pledge that we sent home for parents to sign. 101 adults took the pledge. Edge of fair testing. Here are a few pictures that we took while testing the students and adults at the Fort Concho Edge Affair. We tallied how many times they swerved, went off the road, hit other vehicles, spun out, or hit the wall during a controlled test and a texting while driving test put on by a Mario Kart Wii, Wii racing game. Our experiment was based on the Virginia Tech study. These are the results after the student simulation test. As you can see by the graph, they were more hazardous texting while driving. Adult texting while driving simulation test. By the graph, you can see a big difference in the adult's ability to operate a vehicle while being distracted by texting, and they prove to themselves and others on the road how dangerous they are. Teen survey results. We took a <coughs> survey, survey on 20 local teenagers. 80% of them said that they text while driving. 70% of them said that they would quit if it was against the law and 35% of them said that they have nearly been in a car accident because of texting while driving. Mayor, we, Mayor Alvin New made, meeting. We submitted a proposal to Mayor Alvin New in hopes of establishing a local no texting while driving awareness week. Instead of a week, the whole month of April was <laughs> been declared as awareness 
as Awareness Month as Arrive Alive Month for the city of San Angelo. Here's a map of the United States and there are 39 out of the 50 states that have texting while driving vans. Trip to the Capitol. Here are some pictures that we took when we went to speak with State Representative Tom, uh, Drew Darby and Tom Craddock's staff. Support of legislation. We first met with State Representative Drew Darby's local secretary, Cheryl D. Gordova, to speak to her about what we could do to help pass the bill. She also invited us to the State Capitol to speak with Representative Drew Darby. Then, we wrote up a petition for others to sign here locally in support of the bill. We got 224 signatures, including Drew Darby's. On February 18th, we went to the Capitol in Austin to speak to Drew Darby. Also, we presented our petition to former Speaker of the House, Craddock's Chief of Staff. Representative Craddock included our petition when he presented to the Committee on Transportation. How you can make a difference. Encourage youth to sign the Pledge for Life contract, which states when they are 16 years of age, they will pledge to not text while driving. Support the Alex Brown Bill. Alex Brown is a teenager who was killed due to texting while driving and ejected out of her vehicle because she was not wearing a seat belt. Therefore, Tom Craddock has named the bill in her memory. Tips for changing. Pull over to use your phone. Download a Drive Mode app which automatically sends a message out that you are driving or turn off your phone or store it somewhere that you cannot reach it. Mentors. Mayor Alvin New. Mark Speed with AT&T. State Representative Drew Darby. Drew Darby's local secretary, Cheryl D. Cordova. Legislative aide Victoria Messer, Chief of Staff Jason Modlin, former Speaker of the House, State Representative Tom Craddock, Chief of Staff Kate Huddleston, David Hooks, and Jennifer Brown. Conclusion. As we have proven with our surveys and studies, texting while driving is a dangerous habit many drivers have developed. We set out to raise awareness and support legislation prohibiting texting while driving, and we believe that we accomplished these goals. Here are some of the resources we used throughout our research. We would like to end our presentation with a motto that encouraged us. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. By Edward Everett Hale. Thank you for taking time to watch our presentation on texting while driving. Together we can make a difference and make our roads safer for us all. In memory of... I do have one. Of the 101 adults that took the pledge, was one of them Dr. Caroline Bonds? Do you know? <laughs> I just had to ask. Thank you so much. So as you see, the, the future is bright and uh, the program is, is worthwhile and we wish you all well as you continue to compete, okay? To, so congratulations on your gold medal and, and uh, look forward to great things from you, okay? Thanks. I'm, uh, I didn't see Dolores. Dolores, are you here today? There you go. Come on. We've got a fairly good group, so I'm not seeing everybody today. <coughs> Next, we have the National Service Recognition Day, April the 9th, 2013. This is being accepted today by Dolores Schwartner, who's our Concho Valley RSVP director, Silvia, Silvia Nombrano, our senior companion director, and Lindsay Elliott, our foster grandparent, grandparent director. A proclamation. 
Whereas service to others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet challenges. And whereas the nation's mayors are increasingly turning to national service and volunteerism as a cost-effective strategy to meet city needs. And whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps address the most pressing challenges facing our cities and nation from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families to preserving the environment and helping communities recover from natural disasters. And whereas San Angelo has all three senior core programs, Concho Valley RSVP, Foster Grandparent Program, and Senior Companion Program, whose volunteers meet local community needs on a daily basis. And whereas national service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career skills, and leadership abilities for those who serve. And whereas national service participants service, serve in more than 70,000 locations across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being. And whereas national service participants increase the impact of the organizations they serve with, both through their direct service and by recruiting and managing millions of additional volunteers. And whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on taxpayer dollars. And whereas AmeriCorps members and Senior Corps members volunteer uh, volunteers demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intense commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors. And whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a priority with mayors nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities, and is joining with mayors across the country to support the Mayor's Day of Recognition for National Service on April the 9th, 2013. Now therefore, I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim April the 9th, 2013, as National Service Recognition Day. Dolores, you. you bet. Well, good morning, everyone, Mayor New, City Council members. National service is really important in the communities across the United States, and this is one way of recognizing it and showing the importance. And the mayor mentioned that it is a community partnership along with the federal government. While we're funded federally, all these programs have a local sponsor. RSVP, which has volunteers 55 and older doing all types of community work in almost every nonprofit in the community and some across the Concho Valley. Uh, senior companions and foster grandparents sponsored by the Council of Governments. Senior companions support independent living and foster grandparents support children in the schools. And so uh, we're always looking for more volunteers. The, the statement that the girls had at the end of there is if you're only one, we always need one more and one more and one more. And so if you're 55 and older and wish to do volunteer work in the community, come see us because we work with a lot of different uh, programs, both citywide and for nonprofits. And we appreciate the support that we get here in San Angelo. Thank you all. Next, I'd like to uh, invite Marie Aguilar and Kevin Little and Cal Hurley and Bertha Trevino. Who else? Gosh, there's a whole group of you folks from the National Public Health Week. James Flores, Gloria Hale, uh, Julie Vrena. There you go. Hi, James. Hi. Where's the bystanders? Well, they're the, the uninnocent bystanders. <laughs> okay. If I, is uninnocent? Let's let's go through that right quick. We might need a, might need an English teacher to see if I can even say that. <clears throat> okay. A proclamation. 
Whereas the week of April the 1st through the 7th, 2013, is a National Public Health Week, and the theme is Public Health is Return on Investment, Save Lives, Save Money. And whereas the San Angelo Tom Green County Health Department and Family Support Services Department has educated the public, policymakers, and public health professionals about issues important to improving the public's health, and whereas preventing diseases before they start is critical to helping people live longer, healthier lives while managing health-related costs, and whereas investing just $10 per person each year is proven in proven community-based public health efforts could save the nation more than 16 billion within five years. And whereas vaccines are one of the most cost-effective public health interventions. And whereas infants who receive the seven vaccines given as part of the routine childhood immunization schedule, society saves 9.9 .9 million in direct health care costs, 3,000 lives are saved, and 14 million cases of disease are prevented. And whereas preterm births cost the U.S. over $26 billion a year, with average first-year medical costs for a premature or low birth weight baby of $40,000 compared to $4,500 for a baby born without complications. Whereas a pregnant woman may participate in WIC for approximately $743 a year with an average participation length of 13 months. And whereas research has also shown that breastfed infants may have a reduced risk for childhood obesity. Now therefore I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of April the 1st through the 7th, National Public Health Week in San Angelo, Texas, and urge all citizens to support this charitable effort. Uh, good morning. On behalf of Code Compliance, Nursing, WIC, Health, Animal Services, uh, we thank you all for this recognition and we uh, thank you for letting us be an integral part of everyday society. Um, I think these four or five departments here uh, deal with the citizenry um, probably more so than a lot of others. So uh, we, we applaud that uh, uh, y'all y'all recognizing us and thanking y'all for letting us uh, be a part of y you guys' community. Do I have three different ones that are slightly different? Two? Let me see. proclamation. Whereas the City of San Angelo Animal Shelter took in 10,113... Uh, you mean called, um, Sheriff's Office? Yeah, you bet. You bet. Thanks. I appreciate you, Sandra. Okay. Hi, y'all. How are you? Good. Here we go. This is an Animal Services and Tom Green County Sheriff's Office and Trustee Program Appreciation Day, April the 2nd, to be accepted by Julie Vrena, our Animal Services Manager, and Jeremy? No, uh, Jeremy's actually working the crew. Oh, see, I got two names here and neither one fit the two <laughs> folks. Okay? So, Todd Allen and Beth Mall. All right, Todd <laughs> Allen and Beth Mall from the Sheriff's Department. <laughs> Outstanding. And our, our uh, chief is here too. Okay. Hi. So we have also Chief Deputy Dale Pierce in, the, in attendance. Okay, let me read this proclamation then. The proclamation. 
How am I doing now, Sandra? Okay. I had a girl. Okay. Whereas the city of San Angelo Animal Shelter took in 10,113 abandoned and unwanted animals in 2012, and whereas the irresponsibility of pet owners has resulted in animals running loose and unsupervised, causing a threat to public health and safety. And whereas indiscriminate breeding allowed by irresponsible pet owners who have not had their pets spayed or neutered has contributed to pet overpopulation. And whereas the overpopulation of unwanted and homeless animals continues to place a heavy burden on shel shelter staff when the shelter is the only open admission shelter in San Angelo, Tom Green County, and the surrounding counties that never turns away any animal for any reason, even if there is a lack of available space. And whereas animal control officers and shelter staff must respond to these community problems and crisis, and whereas shelter staff deal with the stressful and emotional task of caring daily for abused, neglected, and unwanted pets, only to see their love and care too often end with only some of these animals finding good homes. And whereas the work of animal shelters and the important services they provide often go unnoticed and underappreciated by the citizen, and whereas animal shelters act as safe havens for homeless and abused, abandoned and unwanted animals, providing them with comfort and care as space permits. And whereas in partnership with the City of San Angelo Animal Shelter, the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office through the trustee program provides the animal shelter with county trustees. And whereas the jailer in charge and trustees that volunteer for the program clean kennels, provide food and water to shelter animals, and clean other shelter general areas daily, thereby enhancing the appearance of the shelter and helping maintain a certain level of health and safety of the animals. And whereas the animal shelter receive their annual inspection and pass their inspection with favorable comments by the Department of State Health Services Zoonosis. Why did y'all do that to me? <laughs> Zoonosis. Is it, did I, okay. Uh, branch during a surprise visit on February the 8th, 2013, and whereas the inspector was pleased by the positive changes made within the last two years. Now therefore I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby designate April the 2nd, 2013, the City of San Angelo Animal Shelter, Tom Green County Sheriff's Office, and Trustee Appreciation Day. I would like to I'd like to say thank you to the jail captain and the sheriff and everybody for allowing us to continue this contract with the inmate um, program the inmates do a great job they're there every day and they help us clean kennels feed animals and they they're part of our vital everyday function so just want to give them a round of applause and say thank you very much Sneak by. Oh, you Coming up, Father. I'm joined today by Father Rodney White, uh, who's here representing Bishop Michael Pfeiffer, and we have a proclamation concerning a special time of prayer for rain. Proclamation. Whereas there is an urgent need for rain in San Angelo and the surrounding areas of West Texas, and whereas we know that by placing our confidence in Christ, who told us to ask for every good gift, and that when we ask in his name, it will be granted. And whereas we ask our kind and loving Heavenly Father and Creator to bless us with special gift of this much needed rain to fill our lakes, streams, reservoirs, and aquifers. Now therefore I, Alvin New, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council do hereby declare Sunday, April the 14th, as a special time of prayer for rain. And would invite all people to join in prayer on this day in their churches and in their homes 
homes for this beautiful and heavenly gift so our humble and heartfelt request may be granted through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father. On behalf of Bishop Pfeiffer, uh, we thank uh, the, the mayor and the city council for this proclamation. And uh, especially um, Bishop has asked um, 30 communities throughout the uh, area of West Texas to um, offer such a proclamation as well so that we together, all people of faith in West Texas, can pray together for rain. And so for that, we thank you. And also today, I have a recognition for Rex Rogers. How are you? Good. Good. Rex uh, won a contest suggesting the name for re the rebranding of the city's government access channel. So channel 17 <laughs> became SATV. The City of San Angelo's Government Access Channel on the Suddenlink Cable System is SATV. Uh, we air meetings of the City Council, other boards and commissions, the City Interview Show, Employee Spotlights, Nature Center Shows, City-related public service announcements, and other original programming related to San Angelo's municipal government. At this time, I'd like to recognize Rex for uh, winning the contest and for his contribution. We have a certificate here, You Make the Difference, commending Rex Rogers, contest winner for branding the City of San Angelo's Government Access Channel SATV. Thanks, Rex. Are you going to put the picture on SATV? <laughs> Mayor, I do have to ask how long it took Rex to come up with that name. How long did it take you? Well, I can tell you that you do get a, a, a a little bit of a sense of the fact that SATV, something nice and short and sweet, fits the character of a gentleman who doesn't want to speak, right? <laughs> so. I know y'all think we need a break, but we don't. Is it the public? At this time, we take public comment. The council takes public comment on all items in the regular agenda. Public input on a regular agenda item will be taken at its appropriate discussion. Public input on an item not on the agenda or on the consent agenda may be identified and requested for consideration by the council at this time. The council may request an item to be placed on a future agenda or for a consent agenda item to be moved to the regular agenda for public comment. Uh, council? Yes. Four? Uh, I have two and six. Two, four, and six. and six. Okay, I have items off of the consent agenda being moved to the regular agenda. That's correct, right? I think you said just two and six. I but said he four. said four. Oh, I'm sorry, you said four. Sorry. So, uh, uh, yeah, but it is from the consent agenda to the regular agenda is what yes. we're asking for. Okay. Okay. May I get a motion concerning the consent agenda, recognizing items 2, 4, and 6, please? Motion to approve consent agenda, excluding items 2, 4, and 6. Second. Okay. Let's call for the vote on that. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I'll start the meeting with item number 2 uh, after I do public uh, I comments. Okay. okay. You want to speak first? Uh, fine. I just wanted to let you know that I had a public comment. Okay. Do we have public comment from the audience? How are you? Good morning. Uh, Jim Ryan. I thought about holding this until item number nine because it is related, but it's a little different. Something that came to my attention, and I think we've given a heads up to a lot of people. 
Uh, we're anticipating uh, a considerable bump in hotel occupancy tax due to the incoming people working the Klein Shale. Uh, something that has come up in southeast Texas with the Eagle Shale, uh, the state gives a 30-day exemption on hotel occupancy tax. In other words, if someone moves into a hotel, starts using it residentially, and stays there 30 days or longer, they no longer pay occupancy tax. Now, there's not a great deal that we as a city can do about this. It is being addressed at the legislative level. There's uh, HB 56, which uh, would, would undo this exemption. And I understand that Mr. Darby's on it, but uh, I would suggest that we might want to coordinate with Mr. Darby. Perhaps a resolution would be helpful to his cause. I know it's being worked on down there, but uh, one thing they found out in the Eagle Shale, the Economic Development Institute at UT has discovered that 77% of the hotels down there have as much as 90% of their rooms now exempt from hotel occupancy tax, which is really hurting those communities because they're no longer receiving any money. So we might want to coordinate with Mr. Darby and see, uh, see if we can help push this through. Okay, thank you very much. Other, other public comment? Okay, comment uh, from council? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to clarify something and if I'm wrong, then somebody please let me know. Uh, the article about the uh, trash pickup people on Good Friday that stopped his truck in the middle of the street to help a child retrieve a ball out from under a car. It's a good citizen thing to do. There were a few write-ups in the paper thanking uh, the city for this employee to stop that truck and assist a child who could have been hurt or killed. I just wanted to clarify it's not the city's employee. That employee is Republic trash uh, company that contracts with the city and I didn't want the city to take credit when it was another entity their employee who uh, did the good deed in, in, on Good Friday. Outstanding. Other public comment or comment from uh, council? Okay. Let me move us forward then. This is item number uh, two. No, let's see. Two. Hang on just a moment. But it was a nice walk. It's part of our wellness program, Mr. Dixon. Okay, items two, four, and six have been moved to the regular uh, agenda, and so we'll start that meeting, but after we do this concurrent meeting with the Planning Commission. So that's what I was working on. <coughs> At this time, uh, what I'd like to do is open a session and call to order um, a special meeting where we have a concurrent meeting with the Planning Commission. So if you folks would come join us up here at these tables, uh, then we can work together for a little while. Okay, standard, standard process would be for me to open the session as part of the City Council and ask for the Chair uh, to open the session for the Planning Commission, okay? And then uh, we'll let Ms. Faber make any, any uh, initial comments and then we'll, we'll work together. <coughs> 
Okay, so uh, I'm declaring this uh, meeting come to order for the City Council and uh, welcome the Planning Commission. And uh, the Chair for the Planning Commission, please go ahead and open the meeting for your group. Okay. AJ, what's the procedure for us to open the meeting? We'll just state that you have a quorum and call the meeting order. Okay. We have a quorum, and I declare this meeting open for the Planning Commission of the City of San Angelo, Texas. Okay. Ms. Favre? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us outside of your usual meeting date. Um, staff will be here uh, throughout the discussion this morning to answer any questions that you might have. I know that the uh, Planning Commission had asked us to set up this joint session with the Council um, to try to get some guidance from you as a group, to try to have some open discussion about expectations and to try to frame this entire discussion before the work uh, really gets underway at the Planning Commission level. And so um, I'll let Mr. Lawrence perhaps lead the uh, discussion of, of what is expected and being requested from you all. And uh, myself and, and Mr. Hintz from our Planning Division are here to uh, provide you with some guidance, some feedback, and answer any questions as necessary. But I really think we're looking for, uh, for the Planning Commission to obtain some guidance from you all as a group. Okay. Mr. Chairman, how about an introduction of each of your members just real quick? Yes, uh, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Bill Lawrence. I'm the current chairman of the Planning Commission. Uh, I work out at Goodyear as the, uh, in the financial department. Doris. Darlene Jones. Uh, I represent Buggy Express. <laughs> okay. Bill Wynn. Okay. Uh, Joseph Grimes, uh, vice chairman of Planning Commission. Uh, I'm with Justin Communications. Ryan Smith. Okay, very good. And um, specifically, I know that you wanted to spend some energy on things like the recreational vehicle uh, guidelines, and, and I think fairly quickly I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Valenzuela so he can walk you through what that uh, housing group has been working on and, and then just let a conversation uh, take place from there. But also let me understand if there's something else specifically you want to make sure Council helps give guidance on. Well, in particular, we want to understand what, what our timing uh, requirements are. We are actually already working and we have directed staff to come up with a coherent plan going forward for the type of um, uh, temporary uses that, that, that we're addressing here. Uh, I, we, we have, our current ordinance actually handles this quite well, but it, doesn't, it does that by not, simply not allowing it the way we're interpreting it. So uh, we're working towards finding out where the community is as far as locating these uses, whether the community wants to exclude these uses, or, or what, what variation on this, this is. And to that, you have access to information that we don't have. You hear, uh, we, we have the information that is brought to us at the meetings, but we were hoping that you would share with us what you've been hearing and how you feel about this issue so as we direct staff to go forward to construct something, a, a solution for this, that we would be better informed. Right, definitely we need to be in concert a little bit on this issue. And so we appreciate you being here and asking uh, for this. And uh, at, the, at, the pre, at the council meeting last, uh, two weeks ago, we did give some guidance to this housing committee that's been brought together to work with you uh, to walk through uh, some some fact finding. So, for instance, <coughs> what do they do in South Texas with snowbirds? Okay, who are under our ordinance uh, wouldn't be allowed to be there for three or four months or five months at a time, and and so forth. And should we make any changes? And and uh, and then also we've asked that that group look into and vet some of the ideas and and uh, processes that might be in place in other places that are that are uh, affected by an oil filled uh, activity <coughs> level. So Midland, Odessa, or Crystal City, Carrizo Springs, or some place in North Dakota, or <laughs> you know those kinds of things and so so that we would be able to get this group to do some work for you and then uh, start vetting with you the different ideas that 
that could make sense uh, and whether or not we want to change our ordinance and uh, and make any changes to what someone can or cannot do it seems to be council and of course everyone here will will, will voice their thoughts in just a second but it seems to be council's yeah. Uh, direction that <coughs> that uh, recreational vehicles are supposed to be temporary uh, in their nature not become a permanent house uh, so uh, but so with that let me turn it to uh, to mr. Valenzuela and let me turn it to each one of the council members and then back to you for individual okay. comment okay I'll just kind of um, add to what the mayor just said we do have a the city of uh, San Angelo housing committee that's been established to address concerns uh, as far as housing, um, the growth, future growth, and we've had a, a couple of good meetings. Uh, we have it's a 26 member uh, committee, and at this point, uh, what we've done is to make sure that we decided uh, in looking forward, you know, what were going to be the priorities that we're going to be addressing. Uh, three of the priorities that came up um, were for the single housing. Uh, for multi-housing and of course the big one for you guys that you're most, most concerned about is a temporary housing and how we're going to address that. What we've done is establish uh, subcommittees to address, as the mayor mentioned a while ago, to kind of do the research and address each one of those priorities. Each committee will address one, uh, for example, one committee will address uh, the single family, one the multi-family will have one specifically that's going to uh, address the temporary housing. Uh, that is really the area where I'd love to be able to get the uh, the uh, participation, of course, of your board to make sure that we're on the kind of the same page. Any concerns that you might have, that we are addressing that. Now, these meetings are, uh, as far as the meetings will be held this week, also starting tomorrow uh, afternoon, uh, culminating to Friday, we'll be having the meetings with the three different uh, subcommittees, and um, on Friday being the day that we address, of course, the temporary housing. What uh, we want to do time and time and place. Yeah, the time Friday. the time is going to be at this. Uh, the time and place, of course, will be at City Hall uh, on the second floor. At, uh, at the meeting starts at three o'clock and it ends at five o'clock. Uh, you're more than welcome, of course, to join for to be there for each of the committee meetings. Uh, but in particular, what are, where I would love to be able to ha be able to have you there, or at least representation, is for the temporary housing. And that way, again, you'll get a good feel for what we're looking at, at what the uh, stakeholders of that committee are looking at it also. Of course, we always address uh, anything as far as growth in our communities with smart growth. We want to make sure that we are placing, um, uh, especially in temporary housing, the areas that uh, best fits our community also. And I know that's a challenge that you're faced with at this point, and that's where you wanted to get the input from the city council members. Again, this week we'll be able to get the input from the committee members, the subcommittee members, on temporary housing and what they feel uh, would be a good fit. And this is actually going to be a planning process that's actually going to establish action steps, uh, performance measurements, uh, in order for us to be able to measure how we're doing uh, in the plans that we're setting forth. So again, that is something that is in the works, and this week is uh, when we actually get the a, uh, a lot of the planning done, the action steps done this week. Uh, after this meeting, what I'd love to be able to do is, of course, see whom you would like to dedicate or uh, if all of you would like to, to participate, that'd be wonderful. If not, representation, um, a couple of members would be, would be great also for the, uh, the temporary housing committee. But anyway, it is in the works at this point. I think we'll have a lot more clarity. Um, after that meeting, we'll have a better idea of exactly what it is that we're looking at action stepwise also. Okay, let me ask and let council members uh, come in here and and make any comments they want to and then I'll turn it to you and your board okay sir uh, anything you'd like to say folks mr. Morrison I would just like to state and this is my opinion on this but I feel that RV parks that serve temporary residents are very important to our community and we need to, to take care of them because we have, we have all the many different things that we want vacationers to come in. We need a place to put them, a good clean place where they can stay. And RV parks and these long-term living parks, in my mind, are two separate animals. They're, they're two separate identities. And we need to deal with these separately. We need the RV parks and we need to deal with them and we already have rules that govern them where they say that they cannot stay, people cannot stay in these parks over 30 days. But we need specific rules to govern the permanent living parks where people stay over 30 days. And my suggestion has always been from the beginning on this is that we've got an industrial park sitting out on the edge of town that's been there for 30 years. 
and this would be a perfect place for public-private partnerships to put these permanent living parks in the industrial camp. That way they'll all be together. Uh, the city can make a little money off of this to take care of us when the boom is over. And also we'd be able to, to police them differently than we do the RV park. So that's, that's my suggestion. So very specific geography is an important part on yes, the long Yes, sir. I term. think they need to be together. I think they need to be because you've got an entirely different set of uh, opportunities that come at these permanent living parks that you do not have with the RV parks. But so then the RV parks uh, with temporary, and I'm just just making sure I heard what you said. Yes, sir. But the the RV parks for vacationers would have more geographic uh, opportunity, but a lot more strict uh, stay requirements. And then the long-term type of environment would have geographic specificity. That a would be place where they belong. Because we already have the 30-day the 30-day notice in, in place for the. We already govern those. We okay. we've never had any problems with them. They're they've worked well, and we need them. But this is a different type of deal that we're working with here. And yes, I would put them in a geographic location. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Anyone else, Mr. Silvas? I, I the only thing I wanted to add is. I certainly don't want to copycat what other communities are doing. And I know you mentioned a lot of uh, communities down in South Texas, but I'm interested to see what AJ or her staff have done, or even the planning commission have done, to see what the Midland Odessa's are doing wrong. So, and that's one thing I don't want to fall us to fall into. Uh, we took a trip to Midland here a couple of three weeks ago, and we saw some of those so-called. And I don't even want to call them man camps. Somebody was offended by them being called man camps. But it, it, they were, it was a blighted area that I saw. I said, man, I hope we never get to that. So my question is, and I'm very much interested to see what AJ and, and her staff are doing to investigate, to educate themselves on yeah, what, what this group is okay, on what uh, not to do that's okay. being done. Well, I mean, are you wanting Ms. Uh, Favre to respond to you now, Mr. Sure. Silas? I mean, that's okay. part of the, yeah. Well, to answer your question, Mr. Silvis, we're still, of course, very much in the discovery. Can um, somebody in the back turn up the mic because we can barely hear you? I've never been accused of that, but it does not <laughs> sound like it's very loud, does it? There it is. That's a little better. Um, we are still, of course, very much in the discovery phase of, of finding information, but we have worked with our commission very closely. Um, and at the last two meetings, we've had some discussions um, and put together some research that they've asked us to do. So we've looked at, um, number one, looking at, at answering the question of, are these uh, RV parks generally within the city limits or are they usually encumbered by the county? And uh, we found that the, the majority, the vast majority of them tend to be outside city limit areas. That's not to give any direction as to how we do these. That's simply an observation based on the studies that we've done. We've also looked at, uh, I believe, 14 different cities trying to, and we're still trying to get some information out of those cities, uh, looking at various aspects of their ordinance, um, getting some advice from them on what they have seen as unintended consequences of the ways that they've regulated things, sort of what not to do as much as what to do. Uh, we've also made contact with some cities, uh, even out of state, that have seen these uh, populations spring up very quickly in their communities and uh, reached out to them and are still in the process of trying to get some information from them as to uh, what to expect, what not to do. And then the Planning Commission had a very detailed discussion uh, of looking at different aspects of the ordinance, taking the ordinance or what an ordinance could be made out of into various parts and examining uh, individual pieces of that, such as length of stay, uh, such as what zoning districts might be important, such as the question of would we rather handle this uh, as we currently do with campgrounds and, and recreational uh, vehicle parks for the vacation type of purpose through a special use process that would allow both commissions to see every case and place conditions on it, or would there be more of a comfort level to allow it by right in certain zoning districts? So these are the sorts of information that we have been pulling together for them. Um, and we can certainly provide all of you with what we have so far, um, as we have with the Planning Commission. Uh, so we'll be happy to send that out to you and let you sort of peruse it at your, your leisure if you'd like to do that. And if you have additional areas that you feel strongly that we should look into, uh, certain aspects of an ordinance that you're particularly interested in, we will add that to the list of what we were trying to obtain. So uh, that's very short overview. but 
I do want to add, of course, that that's something that, as far as our committees will be looking at also. Um, and we don't want to do um, double the work either, because I know there's a lot of work that AG and their staff is, will be doing. But this is all that's going to be incorporated also with the planning that we, uh, the planning and the subcommittees. Uh, one thing that um, Mr. Dane and I discussed last week also was just make sh making sure that we have uh, each one of our members um, ca uh, contact their counterparts, for example, in Odessa Middle, and actually uh, spend some time with them. Go down there, uh, take your notes, make sure that, again, one of the, one of the things that uh, Mr. Silas just mentioned a while ago is we don't want to repeat what was done incorrectly uh, in those communities. So that's something, uh, of course, that uh, we'll be expediting and making sure that we address. Further, Mr. Silas? Uh, that, that's, that's a good start. I am curious. I guess my, my appointee to the plan, is, is he missing? Uh, or who is missing? Um, we, we had a uh, commissioner, Jennifer Boggs, that recently resigned, and she's not had an appointment oh. made yet. Okay. So we are one member short. Well, I think I, I recently assigned a member who may not have you made did. it to we the first meeting. You did. We just did her orientation yesterday. So this right. is pretty intimidating for a first meeting, but she will be joining us immediately and getting into so that the gives you the two that are, not, that are not here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. <coughs> um, other council members with anything to say? Ms. Farmer? I'm not against growth and I'm not against uh, our city adding to its uh, population uh, people by any means. Uh, I don't have anything against the oil field or the workers or anything like that, but I do strongly believe that we shouldn't allow these in the city limits for a number of reasons which I have stated when I appeared before the Planning Commission in the very beginning uh, and suggested I was the one who suggested the city farm the industrial center out there to have them all in one location which is easier to police uh, for a lot of reasons we don't have Ms. Farmer, I'm sorry to interrupt you are you parsing I'm trying to make sure I'm hearing this correctly too and that they are are you parsing the vacationer and the different and the long term again so you're not saying that an RV park for a vacationer wouldn't wouldn't be allowed in the city limits but you are saying that something with a more long-term implication should not be no I don't want them in the city limits period uh, but when you said these you, you're talking about both that's what I'm trying to do is make sure you're talking both. about yes RV parks that we uh, temporary housing RV parks that are already in San Angelo by whatever reason special permit or use I don't want any more in the city limits for the ver various reasons Thanks. that I've stated yeah whether it's an RV park or a long-term right care that's what I was asking okay. we have uh, plenty of stuff that's just on the outskirts you know around town that a private business could build and do but it's not in the city <coughs> limits it's too hard to police these parks I've seen what goes on whether it's a vacation because of my husband's business and we stayed in RV parks and pulled our RV and it's not something that I think the uniqueness of our city we have a very very unique beautiful city and people have asked me please don't distort make us look like a Midland or Odessa or Big Lake they're very adamant that they do not want to look like a boom town. Uh, however, it's here, we have to deal with it. And I do believe that the parks should have, RV parks should have a list of what requirements it is to do bid and bid because we've got the planned unit development and special use that someone could come in. Uh, and we need to have in place a written set of guidelines governing just RVs, but not in the, don't want them in the city limits. Okay, thank you. Other comment from council? I'm just curious, you know, after those comments, you've got the campgrounds of America. I mean, are they having policing problems out there? I, I've never heard of, I'm just trying to get the gist of it. I mean, if, if it's policing that's a problem, then I want to know what's going on. How many campgrounds, uh, RV campgrounds that we have in the city limits right now. The only one I know of is the campgrounds of the KOA. Is there any other place anywhere? On uh, the Bryant, South Bryant, the one that we approved as a planned uh, a unit development, that one is there. Uh, on the Bryant, just past the river, 
Um, where's his father? Have you heard of, pol I mean, trouble out there or? No, I have been in cities, Midland, Odessa, with my husband at these parks and seen the activities that go on. We don't have them in San Angelo with the exception of uh, the campground, at the KOA campground mm -hmm. out there. And Spring Creek Marina. Would be One at the lake. Spring Creek Marina. Yes, Spring Creek, Spring Creek Marina. Marina and that one is policed strongly by the owners of the Spring Creek Marina. Uh, they're very, very tough uh, and they have a time limit that you can stay. I just wanted to mention to you for clarification's sake, uh, remember that your ordinance also does allow a certain percentage of the units in manufactured home parks to be RVs currently under the, the law. It's 30%. 30 percent, right? Correct. So just to throw that out there. Well, Sudden Lake Estates, is it still out there by Paul Ann? It's a mobile home park where RVs and stuff that mm -hmm. met s opposition several years ago with citizens. They did not want it in the city limits and it was placed about as far out as it could be. Okay. Other council members? Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, I, I guess I would say that uh, parsing it out between the traditional RV parks and uh, the temporary housing developments, I don't have a problem with uh, with the traditional RV parks. I mean, I think that's that's a good thing for I, I traveled around and I've stayed in them. So, but uh, the thing that concerns me though is that if we if we take the other aspect and say that we can't have temporary housing developments, then you know, I want to be careful that we don't start allowing a ton of these things to come in and people and things changing with technicalities, them, them passing things with, you know, they, they pick up and move and they simply move it by, by two feet, uh, you know, after 29 days. You know, that you, you got to be careful that there's that we enforce things in a proper manner. So with with but with that said, I mean, I'm not, in, I, I don't have a problem with traditional RV parks. I'm not in favor of temporary housing developments inside the city limits. Uh, and I think using, the, and I'm sorry, using the uh, industrial park out there is, is not a good use of, of city funds. And, and I, I personally think that that needs to be a private development for private in individuals to do that, to manage it, to own it, to operate it. I don't think the city needs to be in that business. Uh, in the event that there's nothing available and no one can build them and it has to happen, okay, then uh, we might consider, but really that needs to be a many, many steps down the line. I, I really think that needs to be a private sector uh, activity to, to develop those things. Can I ask a question, Please. Mr. Hirschfield? Um, the, uh, housing that we did for Goodfellow out there across the, from the base. Well, the city bought the land for it to be a private uh, development by a person coming in, so you wouldn't uh, want a that's private that's individual to, if the land was offered by the city all in one place out of the city farm, you see that as different? I, well, I, number one, I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, that's a development for primarily for the uh, military mm -hmm. uh, establishment and and I would support something like that and and uh, there's a fine line I think as far as where we can and, and should go I just don't want the city to be in competition with the private business out there okay. that it's said know, another way would you would you support if a private company came and said you know here's where we want to put we want to do this and would you support selling city land to them to do that in the industrial area, I think, is a, a way of asking Ms. Farmer's question mm -hmm. slightly different. Not in the industrial park, okay. but possibly if they wanted to develop, someone wanted to come in and develop it, and uh, the city farm, per se, or something like that, some other city land, uh, <coughs> maybe entertain that. But uh, uh, Okay, this is going to be very interesting how this all coagulates, all these ideas, and they haven't really coagulated yet, so we don't know, we don't have a philosophy, a running philosophy, and that's what I'm looking for, and, and I'm listening all the time. Uh, one of the most important characteristics is we could learn from other cities. This has happened in the Eagle Ford area, it's happened in Odessa, Midland, and that's, that's a wonderful thing that we can look and, 
ask them questions, and they did come here on February 4th, and they said the number one thing to do is don't ignore the problem. Don't think there's going to be a bust. All these, these things they did in Odessa, they said don't do that in your pretty city. You have a very beautiful city. Don't ignore what's going on. And I don't think we are, and that's good. Uh, we're trying to get out in front of this and learn. Uh, we will plan, and we are planning right now. Uh, let me say this, though. What I discovered by just listening to them is lack of housing exasperates most other negative problems that there are out there. Lack of housing, if, if there are avail available positions in the police department, because some of the policemen have moved off to the oil field, if there's no housing, they can't move here, so therefore there, there's still uh, holes in the police force. And we need more policemen now than we did before last year, right? And with this growing population, we need probably another five or six policemen to be trained right now at $65,000 a piece for 11 months. But, but we can't get them here if there's no housing. Okay, that's, that's one example of what housing does, and it's already happening in my business. We're losing employees, we're having to give them pay raises, and we can't find more employees. It's gonna happen to the city, and whatever you see this year, times four next year. So, what? people moving to the oil field, four times more people will move to the oil field next year. Okay, the amount of people moving to San Angelo, four times more people will move here next year. That's a, ba that's a rough figure, but when you look at the Eagle Ford, that's, that's what it shows. These graphs are exponential, and the next year is times three over that. So we're just at the beginning of this. It's gonna get serious, it's gonna get tougher, faster, and, and we need to have a very clear idea of what's going on. I think we've reached our goal. If an investor can look at a piece of property, and before he, we can go talk to the city and talk to AJ, and he would know before he ever got started, is that a good piece of property for an RV park or a long-term park? We'll call it long-term park right now. He would know before he ever got started whether it's gonna pass the planning commission and city council because we have very clear, concise rules that everybody can understand. That's when we've met our goal, and we're not even close to that because we, we don't know what's going on. Uh, and so investors can't know what's going on, and that's bad. And if they can't know what's going on, they're not going to build housing here, and lack of housing causes all the other problems. Um, and lack of housing drives up rents, $1,000 a room in Odessa, and rents on their way up right now. So if you're a renter, you're poor. If you're a owner that's renting out, you're rich. That's, that's an economic imbalance, and that's the kind of things that happen. So what I'm saying here is we've got to maximize housing or we'll have economic big problems. All right, but then on the other hand, we have a quality of life in San Angelo that's unique. It is not like the other West Texas cities. It is our advantage, and we have to protect that quality of life as well, and I realize that. There's a beauty here that is like no other. It's the, it's the edge of the desert, but it sure is an oasis, right? And then property values. Um, we don't want people to wonder what's going to happen to the property values. That's not good for property values, uh, and it hurts. it hurts sell and resell values and that's that's not what we're about here in the council we got to watch that as well so something i would look at on long-term parks if we have control over it i would say that if they establish there that one or two things have to happen when they leave number one either they can completely clean it up like they've never been there the the boy scout <laughs> motto you know no trace <coughs> or they can convert it to something else like a camp for kids a church camp so one or the other, but it's got, it can't just be a, uh, a war zone after they leave. We have to have planning that goes all the way to the very end and sees it to, the, to the what's going to be later down the road. Um, and then another thing I want to mention last here is I think we need to look at annexation strategies because as we shove all these long-term camps out of the city limits, they're going to be on the entrances of our city, the gateways to our city are gonna be, it's gonna look like Odessa, like you just, I can just see it right now. I can see it because it's happening <coughs> on, the, on the northwest side of town. It's gonna look like Odessa when you're coming in and when you finally hit the city limits, it'll begin to look like San Angelo, but it's still an old town. It's still got that element that you can kind of feel that that's not what we want. So we're not solving our problem necessarily to shove them out of town. San Angelo has more property, more city, uh, more property than any of these other cities. It is our advantage to work with that if we can and look at everything, every possibility of locations from the long-term camps and RV camps, we really need to look at all of them. And okay, so keep an open mind until we come up with a good philosophy. That's what I'm saying, keep an open mind. I got that. Direction for them. What, what's your direction that for them? That last bit about uh, 
<laughs> what happens when they leave is very important. Uh, and then an open mind. I, anything can go if it works. But, but you have to look at every situation. You have to. Uh, but, you, okay. but I think Got from it. a 35,000 foot level, you can look down and say, look, and this is what I'm looking for from the planning department, is tell me where you think maybe RV parks could go without damaging the quality of life and the beauty and the property values in our city. Okay, one. so so I mean, again, it sounds like two things Mr. Alexander is getting to, and one is that if someone ceases doing business, that maybe there's something in our ordinance that starts talking about what happens if they cease doing business, because what, they're of our requ what they're required to do. Uh, so there's something he talked about there. The second thing that he talked about that sounded like uh, uh, an actionable thing was. Um, um, oh crap! You just said it, and I'm losing my mind. At the end, well, annexation strategies. No, um, yeah, you said annexation strategies. The developer, the, the main thing, theirs. the mission is to make sure the developer can know before he ever purchases the land. No, no, it was it was back to geographic specificity. Did you hear what he said? Think about where, if you look from thirty five thousand feet down, think about where you would want RV parks or that kind of thing. Because so we have. I'm we have areas out there by the airport I mean, the in Lake Nazareth that the are just forced of mesquite trees. Is, is you can see it though. Thirty five thousand. You can but see that that's our property. You can look at maps and, say, and but nobody can see it. It's out in the okay. middle of nowhere, but it's our property. So can we make something happen there? All right. That, that's you. what I'm thinking. Is you have to look at every sector of the city and make decisions with an open mind and come up with the best plan for San Angelo. Thank you. AJ could spend maybe a little time with you on annexation and whether you have a part in that and what to do there, but specifically on this RV issue, it was some geographic specificity you heard, okay? And should there be something in the ordinance that says if they cease operation, there's something they have to do, okay? So l let's let you hear those two things. Ms. Faber? I would just um, say, Mr. Alexander, I, I think part of your question is part of what prompted this meeting, and I don't want to speak for the commissioners, right. but right. Uh, from the discussion I heard, I think that that's what I took away from it, mm -hmm. was that a lot of the need and desire for this discussion was simply because where these might be appropriate is a matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. We can give you some recommendations that you may or may not agree with. And so before the commission takes on the work of telling you what they think is appropriate, trying to tap into what you all think so that we don't spend months putting together a plan mm -hmm. and it's not meeting the intent of the, the overall philosophy of what the city is going to take towards these exactly. types of things. So, uh, the word coagulation is really important because it does come together as you keep working this thing, it starts to come together. You start getting a grip on some of the things that have to happen, like no trace or camp, you know, when they leave. The, so, so that's an idea I think we can grab onto. We can get more and more of these together. It'll start coming together, and it can be pretty darn solid at the end. But it's a very creative process, a lot of collaboration, a lot of putting ideas out there that may not work, but some will, and those are the ones we grab onto and develop out. I'm dying to hear from the commission. Okay, <laughs> okay. I, I want you to know it's always a little bit like this where you heard disparate information. Start grabbing the things that were consistent. Consistent was there is a belief up here that there should be a temporary nature to RV parks. If you're going to put something in as a vacation oriented or RV park that our current ordinance probably handles that pretty well. Okay, if you start then parsing out, is there something we want to do here for long, longer term use of RV space? The law now says that you have 30% of, of a mobile home park can be RV spaces, okay? But past that, if we were gonna make a change to the ordinance, the things you're hearing is that maybe we should have a strategy about where that should be. So that sounds like zoning, it sounds like planned development, it sounds like, so it, it sounds like that there should be some effort about where should it be, not hodgepodge per ne necessarily, but there ought to be some organization to where these things ought to be, and that there there ought to be um, uh, restriction on time unless we do something specific and new for something longer term and that in that we're thinking that you and this group 
will learn together some of from some other communities what they've done that worked what they've done that didn't work and that you'd start fa uh, fashioning something off of that learning so that you have either Midland Odessa I suggested that some people in South Texas not because of oil but because of snowbirds have had to figure this out and so that I would suggest to you that you look at at uh, you know people who have had to figure out this kind of longer term orientation what have they done right what have they done wrong and that this committee can help you do some of that work okay and then you would start putting that together to bring back to the council but I think you heard philosophically just putting an RV park in right now it's short term it's and that there is a desire to, to be careful about what the geography is okay uh, now sir please let's let you guys ask questions introduce your own thoughts whatever you'd like to do can I ask the, our city attorney one quick question? Okay. In Miss Bowling, in uh, designating where they can be and only where uh, an RV park can be, do we get in trouble with? I think it's called redlining, uh, placing people of a certain business or what is it? Is a discriminatory act? Okay, Mr. Chairman. The reason why we're here is to find out if there's an appetite with this council to take control of this problem. I can see that there is. Another thing we're here to find out is, do you want us to set up an autonomous system for dealing with these things where you have geographic requirements saying if it set aside requirement A, B, and C, then it shall happen? Or do you want to have like a conditional use or a special use or either this board or both of us together have to approve every new use like this do we want to describe adequately temper these temporary living arrangements which they are not covered in our current ordinance what we do cover very well in, in the current current ordinance is these recreational educational uh, the vacational uh, uses and uh, uh, 30 days or less so do we do we want to describe this new use which the board wants to we want to make sure that you do too as well so we can take control of this because as it was pointed out this this thing is going to occur outside the city limits most likely on the most uh, attractive routes into town if we don't actively grab this and exert control over it now the annexation strategy this is something that that your staff works on and the planning staff works on but we can start thinking about controlling the entranceway so we look good to the outside and then having these these uses in a place where it's the best compromise for our community so we exert control and then we, we come to the best and the best use here we I can see that although you are not unified on the way this should happen there is interest in making something happen and not just letting the other cities you mentioned something like that just occur so staff's already working on this so and it sounds like they're going in the direction that you want it to go which is to take control so I I'm satisfied that AJ is in the right direction what I want I do want to know is are there geographic type attributes that you would wish to see for these temporary housing things did you want to have them where they cannot be seen by the general public or do you not want to commit to something like that right now? No. Those, those are the kind of, if, if they are to occur within the city limits, do you want to make sure there are, are certain things that are, that we present something to you for your approval that has these, these items? I can see that if you're talking about recreational use, it's got to be attractive in some way. I mean, it's got to be something where, like the KOA, it's very close to a lake. But where with the, with the, uh, the other type of uses where you have temporary housing for workers, we're primarily inter interested in going someplace to sleep that this might occur someplace where high traffic high noise and uh, maybe away from other residential uses might be very desirable attributes so I'm looking for guidance so we are looking for guidance on that as well as we try to solve this problem 
Okay, I'm going to start by giving. Go ahead, Darlene. That'll be fine. Well, I think a lot of it is we've discussed all attributes of this thing, but you know, the ordinance that we currently have is very vague, in my opinion. I think it needs to be spiced up a little bit because, like Mr. Hirschfield said a while ago, 30 days. Okay, on the 29th day, what's going to happen is they're going to move two feet because then they follow the ordinance. We need more regulations in the ordinances for RVs, and I think RV parks are beautiful if they're a true RV park. But then we, it's here, it's coming. We've got, I mean, we might as well make use of it. We've got to figure out ordinances to control this long-term living, or as the oil field people themselves call man camps, because it's here. So we've just got to be able to control it a little bit, and that's where we have on the planning commission is where we have issues about, well, if we allow this one to do it, we've got to allow this one to do it, and this one, and it's a permanent thing. Once mm -hmm. you pass that and rezone something, it's permanent. Right. You know, so that's, that's a lot of the concern, and then we don't want to bring something to you and that not be your wishes, basically. Okay, Mr. Wayne. Uh, listen, I think that one of the first things we need to do, we need a name for this thing. We need the classifications. This, uh, you know, it definitely, I can tell you a lot of things it isn't, but I can't tell you exactly what it is. I think we all feel that way. We need a classification. And I think it can be handled far simpler than, than we're pretending. First of all, I don't think there's going to be that many applications in the next few years inside the city limits. We can make it difficult if necessary. Uh, it has to go through the, we could do this. We could um, make everyone a planned development. And I think it should be. So we know what it is. It may be, it may be uh, mobile homes. It may be uh, RVs that move in and move out. It may be ready-built houses. It may be something else that's constructed that's meant to be, uh, you know, served for five, ten years uh, or something of that nature. But I think that I think that we we just can't think of it having to be um, travel trailers moving in. It's going to be something else, and each, that's why I plan development for each one with a special use permit on the property. Uh, to me, it makes sense. What we do, uh, a plan comes to us, we look it over, we find, uh, let's say we find no, no neighbors objecting to it, uh, not a lot of people care that, that it goes in there, we, you know. It has to meet uh, the safety requirements and all kinds of requirements from the city in a planned development. Um, we approve it on the planning board. We pass it to the city commission. And you guys can uh, take it from there. Or we can turn it down and you guys take it from there. But uh, I don't think that there's going to be inside the city limits more than three or four in the next few years maybe five uh, just just saying it's not going to be a great big problem uh, as far as numbers go you know the business uh, i'd just like to say this the business of studying our housing in this city our housing will be taken care of with investors and builders uh, it it will be taken care of in an orderly way this city was built uh, that way. Uh, it wasn't the planning commission deciding where everything has to be. It wasn't the city commission deciding where everything has to be. It was, it was the investors. And uh, I think we could make this thing so complicated that it'll never get finished, or we can work a way that it will work. Think of a name. No. Mr. Valenzuela, I think you need to, to speak to what your time frame is on your committees and what your charge is. I don't think you're quite correct, sir. 
so I don't think we're trying to have the Planning Commission do these things per se I think we're trying to I mean there are builders involved there are investors involved there's every Avenue the real estate uh, group the uh, the apartment association so the idea is just to make sure that we give them the right guidelines and then let the private investment take it from there so and uh, this thing I think you're 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 getting some feel for it name it's longer term temporary housing or longer term non-permanent sure. housing so that that's probably what we're dealing with is longer term non-permanent housing but I really do think that it's important that you understand what this uh, this committee and subcommittees are supposed to be doing because they involve all of the entities you're describing all of the you know several to there are builders on there there all of those folks they're telling each other what they're doing, where they're building, what they're thinking, so that we get the house. Well, you know, I've just people. looked at the building in the last 50 years here. That's just been my experience. And, and uh, um, I, I've seen it as, uh, we, as, a, as a builder or a developer thinking, gee, I think, it, I think this land right here is available, uh, and I think it's needed for housing. There's a market here. And they invest their, their own money in it, and it happens. And it's happening now. I just, when I said yeah. I didn't agree with your characterization, it's not the planning department telling them where. It's them saying, here's what we think. That's okay. What, that's what I was meaning. Okay. Okay. I do want to point out all that? We're, I, I, let me say this. I've seen a lot of, of, everybody has got some good ideas on the commission. Every, everybody does. Uh, and I think we're all working in, a, in approximately the right way. Uh, I just, I just think I'm just throwing out this one idea that it could be simpler done than we're yeah. working at it. And he has down your thought about special, uh, you know, plan development, so that that can be part of the discussion. What about over here? Good morning. I have some thoughts. Uh, whether or not we allow these, I'm going to put my own classification out there, a temporary lodging camp, uh, whether or not we allow a temporary lodging camp inside the city limits, uh, I really believe that we, fud, we should, uh, in addition to that, also address and identify with cleaner definitions the current RV park ordinance based on the specific purpose that we have in mind, the nature and the spirit of it. Uh, that being aside, um, as we entertain the idea to allow this to be inside the city limits, um, we're obviously going to have to create a new ordinance, one that allows the integrity of the current RV park ordinance to remain intact, one that has a completely new and unique function, uh, one that keeps in mind that one day, God forbid, uh, and this is talking to citizens, um, San Angelo might actually need uh, disaster preparedness crews from out of town to help us be restored after natural disasters, uh, as happened in uh, a few years back in Mississippi and Louisiana, where they had these uh, these um, camps move in and and they restored cities, but when they left, they didn't exactly leave a beautiful place where they lived. Um, a camp of this nature would facilitate that type of requirement. I believe that it must revolve around protecting our citizens' way of life and the value of their property in our neighborhoods one that sets the example uh, for the neighboring communities. I forget which one of you said that, uh, but I believe that's a great idea. Uh, the example for how every town after us ought to do it. Uh, it must identify, I believe, a timing requirement for how long they can stay. And I believe that its vernacular must reflect its specific purpose as a temporary lodging camp. This ordinance must have guidelines that are enforceable, realistically enforceable, through code and SAPD, so we might want to ask for their input. Uh, Mr. Alexander, you said restoration clause. I completely agree. Uh, one thing we have with our ordinances for uh, towers is that uh, one year after, uh, one year of inactivity, they must be decommissioned. I think something of that nature might fit. Uh, which is one year of no activity on the land. It must be restored to its previous or better condition. And as uh, far as that meeting on Friday, um, I, I volunteer myself to be there for the housing group Excellent. subcommittee. Uh, I'm the newest commissioner, so I'm really start just still educating myself and all this. Uh, the rest of the commissioners have 
been involved in a lot longer and are a lot more informed. And so, um, I mean, I think I've recently moved here from Austin. Um, and I think in terms of the RV parks, they're definitely something that, that need to be done. Um, I think it's going to bring tourism. I think um, we've got some wonderful hospitals in this town who are improving their research and are going to have some uh, long-term care patients um, who may choose to move into these RV parks. Um, as far as the man camps go, I think, you know, obviously strict governance on them uh, to keep things in order. Um, and, and exit strategy, I agree with that as well. Uh, maybe something even to the point of putting up a deposit um, and an amount of funds that the city can hold on to so that if they do belly up and leave town, we've got money to go back in and, and restore those um, areas. Um, but, you know, as in terms of my knowledge in uh, multifamily housing and that industry when I was in Austin, um, I do know there are a lot of people who do choose to uh, live in RV parks long term. I have a, a personal friend who um, is a real estate investor and he found that it was more cost effective for him to buy a nice RV, move into a, an RV park and live long term and rent out all of his properties. So, um, I, you know, I think there does need to be some guidelines on the length of stay, but um, I do see opportunities where um, reasonable people may choose to live in an RV uh, establishment for long term. So, something to think about while we're going through this. Okay. I'm going to ask Ms. Favre uh, to spend a little time on what what we feel like our and Mr. Valenzuela or whoever else you think uh, would be part of this, but spend a little time on what short term and longer term means under what our current guidelines say. And, uh, and, then, and then go from there. Again, I really think a lot of the work's going to be done by this committee and you, uh, and that that's pressing forward right now, and that maybe what we're asking you to do for the moment is let that work get done before you start making a lot of decisions related to uh, what's going on, understanding that we all have a sense of urgency about that work. And when do you uh, anticipate you'll have your finding? As, as far as the findings, I mean, we're, we're bringing together research, and then on uh, this, the meetings this week, really, we want to uh, start establishing the, the framework as far as the plan and the action steps. So, I mean, we're looking within the next two to three weeks where we can have something pretty solid uh, in place, you know, that we can actually come to you and let you know this is what we've come up with, um, these are the action steps, this is what we feel will work for us. Okay. Thank you. As far, to answer your question, as far as the, what the ordinance speaks to um, temporary as now, it simply says a, an average length of stay of 30 days or less. Okay. So uh, it is. Um, what's the average? Average of who? Average. Meaning of all of all of the different um, tenants that you have. So On the average, your average tenant is staying there 30 days so or less. So some tenants can stay two months, but you have to have some staying two weeks and Correct. one week. And it has to, uh, okay. I know they're staying more than one month right. a lot of times. What would the zoning classification be? I'm sorry. She's well, asking what the zoning classification might be that would be uh, uh, coordinate or, or would, uh, I don't know what, you, I'm losing words too, but. Basically what's fit, synonymous what with that. What would fit this non-permanent, longer term temporary mm -hmm. housing? What? Where right now we have the we have two uh, use classifications that address this um, the, f the first which is what we've been utilizing for all of these is the campground RV park use uh, classification which is allowed in most of the zoning districts uh, with the exception of many of the residential zoning districts but in any zoning district it is only allowed through a special use which is heard by both the Planning Commission and the City Council so there is no allowed by right for that use classification um, we also have a retail uh, use classification, which is a very overarching classification which with subsets. And under the entertainment subset, it also refers to um, a variety of lodging types, hotels, motels, and it does uh, say campground RVs as well. Um, that use classification is allowed by right in some zoning districts, and most of those are commercial in nature. Um, okay. Help me out here. Say on uh, Loop 306, where the time clocks plus, there's a vacant lot right there, and that that is zoned a commercial um, use. So if 
I own that land. Could I go out there and buy a man cave kit with these items and put it on that land? I mean, it's, you know, several lots. It's a half a block, you know, size residentials on the other side. Uh, could that happen? Something like this. It all comes down to intent, and I think that that's what makes the, the current ordinance difficult. If your intent is to utilize that for permanent dwelling purposes, then no, you couldn't. You would have to uh, seek the approval for household living in that classification. If you are looking at doing it for recreational purposes, then you would have to follow the special use procedures outlined for campground and RV parks. If you're looking at establishing a type of complex, for lack of a better word, um, that would be akin to uh, motel, hotel type of stays, but in that type of structure, then you would probably be able to do that based on the type of commercial classification. And I'm sorry, I don't know the exact there, but I would suspect it's probably general commercial. So if I purchased my home for $385,000 uh, in that area, and there's a, a half block section that right across the street as it is, or down the street just ways that is zoned commercial, then they could go in and put something like this in there. And I personally think it devalues my resident, my home. And a as a citizen, I've got problems with it. As a council member, I've got problems with it. I don't want to uh, devalue any person's real estate or their holdings. Um, that's what bothers me about allowing these in the city limits is you take a high risk of property devaluating and uh, you're going to get a lot of people's attention that way. Uh, bad. They're not going to like it when we do something of that. So the placement of a man camp or a, a, a specifically, I, I still don't want them in the city limits. Um, they devalue an area. If you go over between Midland and Odessa and there's a park that's called uh, Modessa. Modessa. And I mean, it becomes trashy because of the constant traffic and flow through 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, in and out, diesel engines and the noise. And I, I'm opposed to something being just down the street or in my neighborhood. And I've had a lot of calls from folks that they're highly opposed to it as well. So I'm expressing that opinion. I think that's probably one of the largest issues that we see as staff trying to utilize the ordinance and apply it. The ordinance that we have, which was passed in 2000, um, I don't think anticipated this type of activity and was really looking at these types of uses simply for vacation purposes. And so the ordinance that we have addresses that intent. And so what we've had to do thus far is be very uh, diligent in visiting with applicants or potential applicants and really getting into the details of what their intentions are with the park to determine if it really is something that the current ordinance intended to regulate or if it's a different animal altogether. And we're seeing more and more that most of the intents that we're getting are a different animal altogether. And so that's been the basis of most of our discussion with the Planning Commission is addressing that sort of area of, uh, of gray. But uh, So again, though, I think what you hear is there's an effort to get you more solid information, uh, giving you information from other communities, what has happened well, ha what has happened poorly, what you could learn from there. There is a feeling that anything that's uh, outside of the vacation use should have some geographic specificity to it, not allowed all over town. Okay, and uh, and that there. So I think those are things you can take away from this that you can act on, uh, and that you'd work next with staff and this committee, and get information, and then and then we would move forward. And anything that you act on as a planning commission between now and the time that those things are in play, you you push off until you have that set of guidelines to go by. Uh, would be the way I would try to direct you. Okay. I've got two final questions. Okay, go ahead. And either AJ or uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're talking about applications. One, my first question is how many applicants have come <coughs> your way or across your desk that we either have tabled or denied? How many there and, and, and why? Is it because of this? And then secondly, uh, clarify for me because I'm still a little confused on the 30% uh, mobile home usage in an RV park is that what in a manufactured in a manufactured park 
uh, manufactured home park MHP which is our zoning district you are allowed to have a maximum of 30 percent of your units as recreational vehicles at least 70 percent have to be manufactured homes which meet all building codes but it, it has no, nothing to do with RV parks mobile homes it doesn't I simply okay. just wanted you to know that there is some allowance for those to be placed now in those districts just so you're aware of that I and mean, I would be totally against that but okay that's sure. I'm clear now. Thank you. Um, oh, the applications? Probably a, a two-part answer, so I'll start. Um, the applicants that we have had so far, I believe we've had a total of six um, that have been looking at doing these uh, for temporary living, exactly what we're talking about here today. Um, we've had a couple of those that withdrew because they saw that we were working through this process and, and knew that they probably needed some more time. Um, and then as far as the, the reasons behind tabling it, that's probably more appropriate question for the Planning Commission Chair. Yes, th this commission has observed these coming in and when the, uh, when the applicant or the proponent comes before the commission, we, we have begun to realize that either they, the intent of their use is for the recreational, educational, uh, vacation type less than 30 days, or it's not. There's something else that they really want to do with that property, but they want to get the, the, uh, this uh, campground type of uh, use designation. When we pick up on the fact, and, and uh, apparently we've been doing a, a, a lot of picking up on this fact, we table the request so that this process, so that the process staff is going through can, can go on. We have no classification. Well, we, we, can un we understand that what they're asking for currently is not covered in the ordinance. It's something else. So we have pretty much put these things on ice procedurally until we can come to uh, uh, some kind of coherent understanding of what our plan is going forward. In cases where it's very clear it's, a, it's actually an RV park, which you saw the, the only case that that, that applies to, where they, with their horse bridle paths and and uh, commitment for the less than 30 days and uh, very very much of a recreational we've allowed those to proceed because they are allowed by uh, under law so that's when but when we understand that they're actually asking for something else there's something else going on we haven't been tabling them as a strategy and we are going to continue to do that so that we can so that we don't have uh, non-compliant uses but you won't have to do it for six months I mean we really are all in a hurry uh, and I think your action is appropriate I think the way you're handling things is appropriate I, I, I you know and um, and I think the name is gonna come out of this <coughs> okay I really I really do they're gonna have to come up with temporary non-permanent housing guidelines and and we're gonna and you're gonna have to help implement an, or, an ordinance and and you can tighten up the current ordinance some during that process or we can visit that and we can come up with something that's new and different that describes this other need uh, that's that's coming that has to do with you know again temporary non-permanent housing but it's m much more permanent than a week in an RV park and so the that's coming and I think the process is moving as fast as it can Actually, I, let me get something here. Quick. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that Mr. Venezuela isn't here, but I want to compliment him on the high quality of his staff. Uh, as we do the research with other cities, we find out that there are gaps and, and they're not even to where we are. So the staff that San Angelo currently is equipped with is actually one of the best staffs in West Texas and, and maybe farther out. Uh, so we really do appreciate the quality that he's been able to put together. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the the thing about it is, I think we have had uh, two that we've post postponed on, right? Or is it just one? Two. No, no, it's many more. Yeah. No, that was actually brought to the. Tables. That were tabled. Yeah, but uh, it's everyone. okay. <laughs> everyone. But but you do have, I mean, we do understand and you understand what you're doing. You're postponing those that you feel like you don't have guidelines for. And uh, we're getting the guidelines right. put together as quickly as we can, uh, working with you, and then we'll move forward from there. Uh, let, let, me, let me say this. I think it would be desirable when we're talking about the true uh, RV campgrounds uh, for snowbirds. They're, they're, one, 30 days is not quite enough maybe I mean suppose they're coming down here for the winter uh, but I want to be careful I understand you uh, okay 
I do. I mean, it's hard. Miss Farmer. I wanted to ask this uh, commission a question. Uh, a special use permit, that comes through you guys, right? Um, and the special use stays with the land. Uh, a special use comes to us both. We, we approve right. it and then you approve it. But it comes, goes to you first, but it stays with the land, right? That's correct. How do you feel about changing, when you rewrite this and do an ordinance, how do you feel about making a special use permit has to be renewed every year? Meaning you've got some control to go in. Uh, I think one of the places. That, that's a stroke of genius. I'm sorry? That's a stroke of genius. That's very smart of you. Well, it's not smart of me. Uh, AJ, uh, in the cities and stuff, in the report that she gave you all about a month ago, I was in the audience and I was reading the material and uh, a city east of us, they make it have to be renewed each year and the reason is they can control that special use or not reissue if they're not living up to standards. And I was wondering how y'all felt and about implementing that as this other city did and AJ is the one that provided the information. I just picked up on it. You're right, and just to clarify, our special use uh, permit procedure, you have one year from the date of approval to obtain your building permit. It does expire if you do not do that. As long as you meet that requirement, it does run with the land in perpetuity. So just a clarification. But we can make it where it's renew renewable every year, every year. There and are there's There's a possibility to do that, yes. We yeah. would need to look into that a little further. I actually think that we're we're all on the same page now with the subcommittees and, and them putting things too. together and I think that's that's kind of our guidelines and changing the ordinances. I think we're kind of all on the same yeah, page and that's kind of what we nearly. wanted. I thought that was when you were bleeding. But uh, are y'all gonna let me shut this thing down or yes, do it? no I have oh. one. I have one. How does cheese okay. calculate? No? Okay, maybe. Okay. Mr. Bill called? or Mr. Chairman, uh, I know that if we are tabling applications or tabled yes. or didn't I, I know that we haven't even gotten to the point where we send out letters of notification so is it safe to say uh, I mean it's safe to say that we're not sending we haven't sent anything out to the surrounding communities but have you guys gotten any feedback on any of these proposed sites I mean any kind of feedback negative positive what have you got well yes we have pretty good attendance uh, when one of these uh, uses is proposed and we have uh, I believe we went seven hours yeah. we had a seven hour meeting uh, uh, not the last meeting but the meeting before and we've instituted uh, uh, like mandatory lunch breaks in between the comments so the uh, we have a very interested citizenry on this uh, this subject and we are we are doing our best to make sure everyone is heard and so that we can gather all of the diverse opinions that are are involved in this very uh, very uh, very challenging subject but okay. yes uh, an example is that there's concern uh, that our current current ordinance is uh, not enforceable of the 30 days you know uh, currently I don't think there is much enforcement of that 30 days nobody's going in and putting a chalk mark on tires and on these trailers or whatever right. there's another concern that we may not have adequate uh, enforcement capability to actually handle these these new uses, and this this may be true. Um, there's there's uses of uh, the juxtaposition of these these uh, uses with other uses that, that uh, really need uh, more than just a buffer, but maybe you know real ge geographic isolation in order for there to be a comfort level with the, the regular uh, residential uses we have here. Right. And there are other, uh, and, and of course there are other uh, opinions that these these uses should not occur within the the, the uh, corporate boundaries of San Angelo at all but then we hear the other argument which is well they of course will uh, spring it's very all around. hard it's very hard to not control also right and then and then we, yeah. we also have the of course we have the classic uh, planning uh, issue of uh, uh, control versus uh, the free enterprise Okay. So d does that to the the 200 foot area notification is that does it apply to this <laughs> something like this? Yes. Yes. It does. But Johnny, okay. there was one the last meeting we have no objections. Get the mic up there. Yeah. Well, the last meeting we had one site that there was no objections at all on. Okay. But we tabled it because uh you want guidelines. I mean, I, again, I think Ms. Jones did the nice job of saying it sounds like we've got this 
uh, where we got a general understanding we have subcommittees working we're we're moving forward so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and close down your meeting for me I'm going to close this down and go to you like some public comment mr. Turner <laughs> okay I'm gonna uh, get you to close down your meeting uh, close down our meeting and go to break but I but he's making the great point that let's do take some public comment and then close things down okay so is, does he want to yes, my name is Jim Turner. Uh, one of the areas you might want to look at that's dealt with this problem historically has been military bases and the military in general. They have a large transit population that tends to fluctuate over time, and they have set up things like housing offices, etc., to deal with this and a public-private partnership housing office for these, call them midterm housing, uh, would be a excellent vehicle to solve a lot of the problems you're dealing with here. Second thing you remember when you're dealing with this, if you force it outside of the city limits, you're forcing it outside of the area you actually have control over, and you're forcing it on to a government that doesn't have as many resources when you're talking to county to deal with problem areas, whether it's health, sanitation, police, you name it. So you have to be careful that you're just not handing somebody else a bag of worms that you don't want to deal with inside town. And if the problems are at the gateways and on the highways leading into San Angelo, San Angelo looks just as bad because if, if the city limit sign is buried under trash, they can't tell. So you have to be careful about that. And you have to have something very much that's enforceable, understandable, and simple. And a lot of the recent history on ordinances we have here don't fit that mold very well and you might on some of these special areas also want to put in there that if you're going to have this type of an area you must supply on your own a certain amount of cleanup capability a certain amount of health inspection capability and a certain amount of law enforcement security public safety on your own you may want to if it's over a certain size say you have to have your own guard on premises to take care of these issues and to coordinate our police department and our public safety with your people there so we need to have in place not only just some regulations statutes and things like that but we actually need to have if you're going to have a midterm housing you're going to have to have additional things behind beyond what you'd expect in an apartment complex and so on. You have to have the ability to take some of the load off of city resources that you're going to be putting there by that, whether it's public safety, health, trash, you name it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, do uh, I need a resolution? Just a moment. I need one more uh, ask about public comment. Is there any other public comment at this time? Okay. Now, Mr. Lawrence. Do I need a resolution to uh, shut our, our meeting down? I don't think you have to do anything except uh, take a motion and, and shut yourself down. Okay. I need a, a motion. I'll make a motion. I second. A second. Okay. Um, uh, all in favor? Five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five, all opposed? Okay. Okay. We'll shut down. Okay. They're in adjournment, and we are going to adjourn uh, uh, our meeting with them at this time and move into uh, a break and then come back and start with the, the regular agenda item number two a quorum so let's go ahead and kick off um, I have item number two uh, number four and number six which I don't think will take very long and uh, um, I have s a group that's trying to make a flight what time is the flight you're trying to make uh, I don't think they have a flight but they have some other appointments they need to try to get to that are out of town okay so uh, the uh, driving right we have two four six and one one presentation that'll last a little bit and then they're up okay so I don't think it will that's why I'm trying to figure out how sensitive because I think they're gonna be pretty quick anyway okay that's okay. fine okay item number two consideration of selecting Selectron technologies which is an interactive voice response system uh, it costs thirty five thousand dollars and uh, has to do with phone-in water billing credit card payment system okay mr. mayor I'm I'm the one who pulled it I don't have a problem with it I think it's great it's wonderful it's long time in coming I just wanted the camera uh, for the video to talk about it a little bit 
if you would, about we're finally being able to take payments credit card wise. That's just wanted to call it to the attention of the public. Okay. Um, this interactive voice response system um, will allow citizens to be able to, to call in and, and not only pay their bill online, but they'll be able to access all their account information. And, and that's crucial. Um, they can get billing, payment, consumption history, balance due, due date, and then make the payment through verbal and, and touch tone prompt. Um, this proposed system will reduce call volumes, and, and that's the problem that, that we're seeing. Uh, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from citizens that try to call in and make credit card payments now, which they can, but they actually have to talk to somebody, and a lot of times we can't get to the phone. So we're hoping this will reduce some of our phone calls. Um, the customer service ladies now are averaging about 4,000 phone calls a month for different things anyway so anything to do to help them I think would be great um, like the mayor said uh, the total cost is 35,000 20,000 that's the initial installation and then there's a $15,000 annual cost. To approve. Uh, we can get with this 15,000 will we'll get us credit for 40,000 phone calls a month so we'll have plenty Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve as, pr as uh, presented, and thank you for the explanation. Question. And, okay, Mr. Silvas. Mr. Dixon, I, I assume this is budgeted? This is within budget? Yes, sir. And also, uh, is it credit, credit slash debit card, or is it just credit? I'm not sure. Hang on just a second. It's both. It's both. Good. That's all I have. Okay, any other questions? Public input? All for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carries. On item number four, this <coughs> is consideration of approving a special recreational lease agreement uh, in a substantially attached form with George Ellis and uh, his wife, Amy Ellis. And uh, it's for an area of about two thirds of an acre. I think Mr. Alexander asked for this to be pulled so yes. Mr. Alexander it, it's just a I don't have I can't find a map I don't know where they live I can't just by looking at the description of a lot I, I don't know what we're doing and my you know my job is to watch over what we're doing and <coughs> making sure that we're not interfering with the the planning going on at the lake and things like that I just I just got to be able to understand that before I, I, do, that. I do have a map and I didn't know this would be pulled or I would try to get you something but I do, do you have know? a map of it do you, it's do you know where they live it's the south end the property just adjacent to the south end of Lake Nasworthy Dam is where the Mr. Okay. Ellis lives. Okay. And the property is across. It's an interior property. Right. It's, it's a, got access easements to all the other have, properties. You have his house on the lake, his neighbor's house on the lake, another <coughs> house on the lake. There's a piece of city property that's interior, doesn't get to the lake. Okay. And that's what he's trying to get permission to utilize okay. is he sharing this recreation this area with other neighbors or just himself or that just no this this piece that he will lease is the only portion that's leased right now okay. other property owners adjacent to that property will have the right to lease it is a section of that land also okay all right uh, it I don't there was not a map as part of this right. uh, presentation he drew it, a great map mr. mayor that was a great map. <laughs> he I, has I saw it. <laughs> it was in the yeah, okay. I saw it. a virtual map <laughs> uh, uh, the thing I wanted Paul to understand is that it doesn't touch the lake or it's not next to him it's actually more or less behind his house okay. in the interior and uh, he's worked with his he's worked with his neighbors right. on access to their properties Good. and on all and you know that. where it is? I do know where I'll it is. I'll hold you responsible. <laughs> I'll vote yes, but I'll hold you responsible. Hold me responsible. That's great. Right behind I like you, that. yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I'll do that, and I'll just say, well, Mayor Newton knew about it. And okay. How many wives can I have? <laughs> <laughs> there may not be a limit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, what else do you want to – do you have That's something there? That's all I have. Okay. Mr. Alexander, it's uh, – did you get your question answered? Or Pretty are you okay? much. I, if you know, you know what's going on with the lake, and you know that property. So if you're satisfied, I'm satisfied. Well, I believe his neighbors are satisfied, that's so that's too. what makes me feel okay. Good. So good. Okay. We'll all hold you accountable. If that's okay. Outstanding. Okay. Maybe in just a couple of three months, y'all can run me out of here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's call for this vote. I gotta have a motion. Oh, motion what, to I'd approve. A motion to approve. I got a motion to approve. Second. Got a second. 
Now, uh, let me see if I have any other questions. Do I have any public input? Call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Let's go to item number six. Uh, Ms. Farmer, this is consideration of a request uh, to release a utility easement and a first replat. And so let me, uh, let me get you to walk us through what you need. Yes, I had talked to Jeff last night, I believe it was, and I, I'm still not certain. You, do you have a map to show us um, how much acreage is this and the location? It's on 14th and Bryant. Yeah. Um, okay. And this is the plat of the property, the way that it sits now, and uh, the property owner is here to explain their intention behind um, abandoning this easement. It's Mr. Blanick. Um, the easement runs through the middle here. It's highlighted in pink. Uh, it's a 25 foot utility easement and uh, similar to subdivisions that we do we've sent this out to the utility companies Suddenlink, AEP and etc got those comments back um, no one had any facilities in that easement uh, the only condition was that um, a replat be done of the property since there's some water service being accessed water utilities needs it to be platted back into one lot so there won't be a lot without service um, so that's where that condition comes from does that answer your question or yes motion to approve second okay I have a motion to approve in a second do I have any further questions Jeff so that's an alley is that right no it's it's okay. private property now it doesn't have any public access only utility access so it'll be uh, when that easement is released so the property to owners that. around that I mean uh, I guess there. oh there are not yeah it's it's the it's the same owner Th there's this is all one lot there's just an easement running kind of where an alley would be there's an easement running through it uh, this is a replat of the miles edition originally okay. so there likely was an alley there at one point but um, it's so just a utility easement now, though. It doesn't affect any, anybody no, else. No. Okay. I'm good. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. I have a motion <coughs> and a second to, to approve as presented. And uh, any further questions? Any public input? Call for this vote. All public input. Come on in. Yes, I have a layout of the. Um, my name is Lewis Blanick. How a boy. And I'm one of the owners of the property. I guess I can start right here. <laughs> this is what's going on it. Then here's some pictures and what have you. Okay. You, you're getting to have a part-time job coming to meetings. That's good. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a Baymont Inn and Suites that will be there. So it'll be 74 yeah. rooms, and, and okay. you can look on there. We're possibly going to do an, a, a, an additional building behind. We're going to leave um, almost a little over an acre back there because we've talked with a lot of the cowboys at the rodeo and what have you, and they've all said, uh, you know, our biggest problem with motels and what have you is place to park our, our trucks and our trailers. So we're going to take that back section of land there behind uh, the motel, and we're going to actually uh, uh, clean it up and pave it so that we the the rodeo people can park in and whoever else has a big rig and what have you and it's uh bryant martin luther king 15th street and 14th, 14th street, street right we own the entire block they'll end up with uh there'll be a big boulevard right 40 foot boulevard down the middle yeah. of the property where this easement is <clears throat> and uh either side will be a 0.905 acre track for a franchise or whatever else so so and then the then the baymont inn and suites be on the back half or whatever right yeah. it's 242 feet to the property where the motel will be from the uh, Bryant Boulevard got it thank you okay you thank you yes thank you. Lewis I've always thought a motel out there with some stables at the back so that these rodeo people <laughs> could maybe some, a horse motel too a horse motel <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right. Thank you, man. I appreciate Thank it. You, now we're Atlantic. we're going to slide back into talking about roosters. Be careful. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we we have a presentation on this item. Do I have a, a motion? I got a motion. I got a second. I got everything. Do I have any further public input? All right. Let me call for this vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Let's move then to item number ten. This is a presentation of the Downtown San Angelo Incorporated third and fourth quarter 2012 quarterly reports. Presentation, presentation today is by the Executive Director, Dale Velasquez. Hello, sir. Good, good afternoon, I think. I'm going to try to make this uh, real short and sweet. Um, 
just recently returned to uh, this position after a four-year uh, break um, as the executive director. And uh, I will tell you that the, the differences are significant in terms of um, just the activities, uh, the new businesses that are, are being uh, coming into the downtown area. Just within the next four or five months, we've got at least five that I know of for sure new businesses that are uh, moving into the uh, downtown district. Uh, I, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to skip all of the different uh, uh, financial information. You've got those packets, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Um, but one of the things that's really important as we see it from our perspective is downtown living um, and w developing and working towards making uh, more availability for people to lease or, or own and rent uh, properties in the downtown area. This particular project that's on the screen right now is well on its way and uh, uh, again uh, we're, we're ecstatic that that is happening in terms of its development. Um, I'm gonna this particular project actually had some financial impact while it was shut down uh, during the remodeling because of the business that it generates. It did, it did impact uh, our, our tax uh, results for the, for the quarter. Um, this particular project, the uh, San Angelo Hotel and Conference Center remodeling has had a tremendous impact for us, especially because of the uh, traffic that it's created for uh, downtown in relationship to, to businesses, uh, seeing some impact uh, as far as uh, what's happened there. Uh, I just went back past the, the building of the uh, San Angelo Area Foundation that's new construction uh, on the corner of uh, Concho and, um, and Irving, uh, a two, over $2 million project that is uh, well on its way. Next Again, year. it's going to have a, a, a significant a impact uh, for yeah. our downtown he area. He flipped through. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Through the slide. Uh, how do I go back? I was the old person. Discount oh, okay, there, okay, there it is. Okay. Sorry. That's, not That's the one I was referring to. Uh, this particular project. How are we doing? I mean, my understanding is that on a couple of these projects, we're having trouble because of the number of entities groups go through. So are you hearing anything about... Uh, the River Corridor Commission, the Historic Commission, the planning process, or going through the planning process and then having to redo something, or, I mean, what are you hearing? Because I'm hearing some problems with that, and I want that addressed and want it dealt with and won't be dealt with if it's not talked about. So right. uh, what, uh, are you hearing things along those lines also? To some degree. Uh, I know, uh, again, referencing back to my first, uh, when I was here to you, four years ago as, as in this position. Um, the One of the things that, that came out of some of the complaints and some of the uh, advocacy work that we did with the city uh, created the development or s helped assist with the development of the uh, Development Resource C Council, which we meet on Friday mornings. Uh, and we have all of the groups that are represented uh, at those particular meetings where uh, new construction or remodeling or whatever it is that's coming in has an opportunity to visit with all of the city represented representatives and that has helped considerably and eliminate some of the some of the okay. uh, downtime but in terms of the commissions the different commissions yeah I, I would say that there's some folks that are well I are know on concerned. one of your projects that uh, the river corridor commission was involved and that the river court you know they'd already been given their permit already moving forward River Corridor Commission's involved. They have to slow down the project, go before the River Corridor Commission, find out that they don't have a quorum, so they don't get action uh, at that meeting, and have to put it back on hold so that they can wait for something to come together so that they can move forward. And I find that uh, just uh, it's know, a just deterrent. untenable. Yes, it's uh, a deterrent when you've got when you've got somebody spending money and trying to construct something, and then you can't get a quorum. Then that means you either don't need the commission because they don't 
fulfill their responsibility or you need to restrict the amount of geography that they're responsible for. This product's not even on the river. This is a block off of the river. So, I mean, if we're going to have trouble with projects, then, then we either need to, to kick them in the tail, make them get together and do their job, take something away from them where they're not dealing with things that aren't on the river I, uh, or, or just, something. Just so. as a note, I believe, and, and I might stand corrected, but I believe that that river corridor has now been combined into the historic. design and historic. And so and I, that was one of the reasons because I had personal experience with the same situation, river corridor, the, 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 all those, and, and so I'm I, I think we're somewhat pleased today with the structure of our design and historic review. Except for it apparently didn't get them to a quorum recently. Correct. Yeah, that is the fact. Uh, okay. Mayor, you know, we, we did, uh, our, I'm not on the committee, by the way, but I do attend the meetings, and the last two meetings we've not had quorums. Wow. Then I think we need to address that. That's its own problem. And that's what I'm describing. Right. It's okay. like here they are involved in these construction projects, so they can't get quorums. And so then these projects can't move forward. That's and correct. So, and so then I'm looking at it and saying, shoot, let's look at what the River Corridor Commission's boundary is. This is not on the river. It's a block off. Let's just start looking at, at setting it up where they don't have to get together if they don't want to. So Mayor, well, let me just say that you're absolutely right, because I just have a, had a meeting last Friday with a gentleman at a church right across the street from the station 618 building and I I'm going to invite Daniel out there but this church has been trying to open for a long time and they're f the city the fire marshal's office has given them hoops and hoops and obstacles and everything and you know it, it comes to a point where they get frustrated and I know we're getting off topic but I just want to throw that in I totally agree that there's there's some commissions out there that just my gosh they just make it well, a little anyway. too difficult um, I'm trying to be on topic by saying there's some stuff here you're saying we're developing downtown. I want us to get out of the way. So yeah, okay. I, I and I agree, Mayor. Dad, uh, what is that going to be? Can this you tell particular us? building discount here, tire. it's discount tire. Oh no, but I, well, there's another one on the other side of Grandy's, is it? Right. Yes. Do you know um, what that is? I don't have confirmation, but I understand that uh, the Starbucks is is yeah, going to be. What I've heard uh, too. Yeah, that, that Starbucks is, is going to be uh, moving into that area. Right. Um, cumulative during the third quarter, uh, we saw a $63,885 and 640, I'm sorry, 63 million, uh, 885,642 uh, in terms of investment and reinvestment in uh, the downtown area during the third quarter. The fourth quarter is not much b d uh, different, just a slight increase. Uh, but I will tell you, again, based on uh, my starting the job in January and what I'm s experiencing and, and the phone calls that I'm getting, uh, in fact, just last week I got a phone call from two gentlemen from Midland who are interested in developing businesses in downtown San Angelo. Uh, and I'm supposed to be visiting with them uh, within the next two weeks. They're coming down to visit with us uh, to see about where and how they should uh, progress with their business plans. Um, we have a light manufacturing company that is also interested in moving from another city to San Angelo uh, that has contacted us that we're working with across the board with different organizations that are all working together. And I also wanted to just make that one comment. Uh, working with the economic development group at the chamber as well as the city, coast of D.C., um, the city staff, uh, all of those entities that are so important for us to coordinate it has, has just been a, a, a big difference in re my relationship, again, ex falling back on my experience in the past. So with that, I'll just conclude this conversation unless you have other questions. Okay. Questions for the gentleman? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Dixon, do you guys to like to bring up our group from Neptune Technology and we'll do the item number 11, demonstration and consideration? I have with me today Charlie Trimble with Neptune Technologies and Abe Rigsby, he's the product manager for customer 
web portal software that he wants to do a, a short couple hour demonstration here that we should be we should be up about two thirty or so so we we should be good if you want to come up and try to get this loaded up while i <laughs> motion to adjourn ramble <laughs> here so um but this is a uh, for your consideration today um neptune software that will allow the city customers that have the amr meters to access their account look at their water usage get alerts see what they're doing set budgets there's a lot of options here um, that Abe will go through. So with that, I'll turn it over to him, and we'll get out of here pretty quick. Thanks for having me. I, I want to give a brief uh, demonstration, and uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, once we get through, and I'll be glad to, uh, to address those. So what you'll see here is the uh, what we call our Inside IQ software. Uh, what would happen is... Uh, we would skin it with the city of San Angelo banner, different things like that. So when the end customer, the utility customer, were to log on to the application, they would see city of San Angelo's, you know, customer web portal, uh, water consumption viewing site. Um, what they would do is um, after the uh, utility, you know, sends out the communication that the site is available, um, they would go and enroll themselves. That way they're not calling the, the uh, utility, bogging them down with phone calls. So we'd send the link out. You'll see here is, is most websites you've, you've probably uh, seen in the past where you signed up for a user ID and password. You would go click here to register. Um, we register your email address and allow you to create your password. So you would put in the email address that you want to use to log in. Then your password, it gives you the restrictions as far as uh, what, what uh, characters and things like that. Um, once you continue to the next uh, step there, we would have security questions uh, so that the uh, consumer would, would be able to verify that this was their account based off of, you know, water bill, account number, different things like that. That way there's nobody in there that can go in and sign up for an account uh, for a particular homeowner that they don't, you know, are not uh, living in and dwelling in. So once that happens, uh, we send an email verification to the email address. You then log into that email account, verify that you do own that account. Then you're ready to log in. I'm going to log in as a, as a customer. So I'm logging in to, uh, to my account. Uh, this is a demo uh, database here, so what I'm going to do is go in and, and show you uh, consumption for a particular time period. I'm going to go back to uh, March the 1st of 2012. I'm going to look at um, my consumption for March the 1st through March the 10th. One thing you'll notice when you log into the account, it has nothing uh, in reference to who I am or where I live. So if somebody, for security reasons, if you were to log, you know, to, to get somebody's email and password, there's no way for them to know where, where this person lives, to look at any, any type of uh, consumption, consumption patterns to, to, to know when you're home and when you're not home. So we felt that was important. Um, you'll see here uh, the consumption graphs. Uh, I, the first thing that, that you would see here is a continuous leak alert. I know you've probably had communication um, from the utility where you have seen that, that our meters do uh, track, leak, reverse flow, different things like that. So when I log on to my account, if I do have a continuous leak, I would see that visually with this continuous leak icon. You would also see uh, the consumption as well as the continuous leak alert and it's showing the number one there. So for that day, um, I have, a, have had a continuous leak. Uh, we also, I'll, sorry, I'll show I, in. I don't see it. What are you talking about? Right here, you'll see a leak icon, okay. the, um, the red faucet-looking uh -huh. icon here. You'll also see the um, where it says consumption, and right underneath that it says continuous leak alerts and the number one there. Okay. Uh, I also want to point out there's a red line that kind of goes across the graph here. Um, that's what we call our daily water budget. And the reason that's important is we take an average of the last four days of the week. So we look at every the last four Mondays, the last four Tuesdays, all the way up to you know Saturday and Sunday where you have a larger number of, of consumption of water. 
uh, and we, we do it, we call it a day of week average. And the reason that's important is when you have um, a fixed income individual who, who needs their, their water consumption to be consistent and at a certain amount, we can then go set what we call daily water budget alerts. So if I want to be notified, if I use 10% over what I normally use for that Monday or that Saturday, I can set that all the way up to 200%. So that way it, it does control me as far as my budget and how much I use. Um, you'll also notice the uh, precipitation and temperature data. We also track that as well. And, and you know, we felt that was important when you're looking at, uh, you know, let's say a drought season. Um, why use more consumption this year versus last year? I know why. You know, the precipitation was lower than normal. And, um, you know, the temperature, it may have been hotter than, than usual. So we also track that as well. You can also go all the way down to hourly consumption. Um, you know, our meters do, do get that low of resolution. You'll see here that it shows uh, every hour. I can just drag over my graph here, zoom in to a certain area, and then I can use my slider to, to, to go throughout the time frame that I have um, specified up top. <coughs> any questions on the viewing consumption before we go any further? I've got one. Go ahead. Does this, this graph appears to show a leak yes. down at the bottom? Would you illustrate what, what uh, constitutes Fort a Council, continuous leak? How you can tell there's a leak on this graph? That constant usage across the bottom of the graph indicates a leak, right? Well, actually, the, the way our meters work, if we, uh, we, we go down all the way down to, to uh, we sample the, the meter every 15 minutes. So if there is water being used in 96, there's 96 15-minute 15, 15 intervals throughout the day. If we, if, we, if we realize there has been usage in every 15-minute interval throughout the day, then we know that there's continuous usage. Now, we, we're very careful how, you, we, we don't want to say you have a leak um, because somebody could, in fact, be using that continuously but um, you know we know we know in fact that there is continuous usage going throughout the meter typically it is a leak but um, you know you got to be careful how you how you but you, you know, can see it. that on that graph would you I'm, show us show council what the symptom is when you look at that graph that there might be a leak the bottom of this graph that you have right there just to there's no the, the lowest no, this this you, is where you just changed it. Well, well, the reason we don't show that in hourly is because it, it bunches up and you it, the icons would stack over each other. All right. Can you so go back to the, the screen you had up just a minute ago? Just the hourly? See how at the bottom? Yeah, yeah and that, that's what I see. We, we look at a daily. Um, just because you have usage in, a, in, a, in an hour, that doesn't mean you have a leak. Okay. But so every yeah. hour does. Yeah, you have you have to sample the entire day to be able to look to know whether they have a leak or not. When a customer comes in and says, "I wasn't using water," but the graph looks like this, usually that means they have a leak. Well, they're using water, not necessarily a leak, but yeah. But the indication. Yes. Right. It when they say they're not using water, but water's moving through the meter, usually that means a leak. The, my More point. Likely. My point is, this has been very helpful for us in dealing with customers. Uh, very positive to be able to see that usage broken down into even hourly. Uh, hourly, I think, is what we've been using. But these 15-minute increments is it's very beneficial to be able to go in when a customer says it's shut off. I'm not using anything, and yet we see this pattern where there is still water moving yes. through the meter in this fashion in a consistent in a consistent amount. Usually indicates a leak or they've left something on. Oh, absolutely. It's very very useful when you're having that that discussion. conversation yeah. yes and that's and that's a great point I know mr. Dixon talked about earlier the cutting down the number of, of phone calls to the utility that that's what we're, we're trying to conserve usage uh, to, to make folks more accountable what they're using as well as cut down on calls into the utility um, complaining about high, high bill complaints things like that because when we see what what we're using um, on a consistent basis it helps the utility to, to, to kind of head off some of those phone calls coming in so um, I also want to point out we, we, um, we, we talk about the leak alerts we take it a step further um, we actually uh, allow the user the utility customer to set up <coughs> alerts to be emailed 
So if, if they don't have, to, you know, have time to log on to the web portal, they can go into their alert preferences and be emailed when we, we have notified continuous usage. So, you know, if, if I want to be notified every day, I can set the notification frequency to email me every day when a leak, you know, when I, when I get a leak notification. Mm -hmm. So that way I can be proactive versus waiting 35 days or 30 days, get my water bill. The water is, is extremely uh, uh, high. Uh, the bill is high. Um, and, and we can kind of head off those and hopefully reduce phone calls to the utility as well. I mentioned the exceeded water budget. We take that day a week average sample, and uh, if I have uh, a certain percentage that that I you know threshold where I want to be notified, I can set that as well. Another thing we do um, to to kind of help the utility out is when we alert the customer via email or just in general when they log on to their their um, account the first thing they're going to see if they've got any type of continuous leak intermittent leak or daily water budget alert is they're going to come up with a similar screen like this and it's going to ask them to acknowledge that they've got those alerts or to cancel if they acknowledge we timestamp that they acknowledge that they got those alerts and and you'll see here to the right this this column here um, in this in this example they acknowledged on August the 22nd of 2012 if they hit cancel the next time they log in it's going to come up again so either have to acknowledge or cancel but we know they saw it so for the utility you know purposes if if a user were to call in they would have verification that they did know that they have received some type of leak alert and if they had not addressed the, the concern whether it be a leaking uh, flapper valve in the toilet uh, a leaky faucet at least the utility was proactive in, in notifying them that that has happened. Uh, the last thing I want to show here is, is the compare consumption. If I wanted to, to look at my consumption for uh, this year or current year or 2012 versus uh, 2011, I could do that. So I'm going to show here March 1 of 2012 versus March 1 of 2011. And you can see here how my consumption patterns have changed from year to year. So my blue bar would show 2012 in this case. Uh, the yellow bar would show my consumption for 2011. As I scroll across, you'll see that highlighted on the graph there. So in this example, it, some months I use more in 2012, some months I use more in 2011. And we also track the temperature and precipitation as well. Any, any questions uh, about the portal? All right. I'm, I'm excited about this. I, I'm, I'm very fired up. I, this is the reason that we put, we put these meters in. It wasn't really, and I know there's other reasons for the meter, but to me, for the end user and for the end result of what we can get, this is what it's about. Because this is a much as big a part of conservation as many of the things that we can do. Because leaks can happen, and they happen every day, and you got to know about it. And when you know, when you learn about it, when you get that $700 water bill, it's too late. Absolutely, that's not good for anybody. For them, for them, for us, uh, because if we're truly, if there truly was wasted, you know, fifty thousand gallons, that's fifty thousand gallons, you know, that's wasted. So, I'm I'm very excited about this. Good deal. Other questions for them? Oh. Move it. She was first. Okay, Miss Farmer, and then Mr. Alexander. I also am excited about it. I just <coughs> have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, okay. people that don't have the AMI meters can't utilize this or tap into so what's your answer going to be when someone calls in is when do I get my new meter well, I don't I don't think I can we can answer those specific dates I mean we're still two years out of a complete implementation of the AMRs 
you know that was a five-year rollout program and that and that's where we're at so we're still looking at 2015 but I think it's important enough that we allow those people that do have it access and be able to to use this and as people come on they can also access their information and and, and that's another reason we're here today we're recommending implementing this software I mean, I, I you do have a plan you right. do have a plan for the rest of yes, implementation right. so if someone was in the next 90 days you could tell them or right. you could tell them it's you're still out there right so, okay so okay we would like that mr. Yeah. Alexander you said a couple of questions did only okay I want to make sure I didn't interrupt I may you. Have, I'm sorry. But that's okay yeah. mr. Alexander for me as well this is a very big deal I've been asking and asking for you guys, and then it said that this programming is not ready and things like that. I, it, it just became very necessary when we look at our droughts and we, people want to conserve water. They're not, they don't have the tools to do so. They call into the water department and the person's already spoke to another 20, 30 people. And they're, for customer service to, get, to increase, we're going to have to take the load off of these people. And this is one way. The voice system is the other way. And then less problems is a, is a fantastic way. This is very good. Um, I would suggest that the city of San Angelo purchase the URL or URLs <coughs> and or here it goes mywaterusage.info .info and mywaterbill.info because it's really easy to remember mywaterbill.info bam that pop the log on screen comes up it's a redirect and it puts it started into the city of San Angelo so we can find it and you can just jump on any computer uh, and get after it now part two is there a mobile version? That's a great question. So, so to look out on your iPad and, and things like that, absolutely. We are um, actually the, this year we're coming out with a version. Um, the reason uh, you can't view this current version is the way the graphs are, and uh, because as you, as yeah, you know, and, and Flash and things like that. So, we are um, uh, in, in process developing a, a mobile app. So, okay. Because half of all the internet activity now is on mobile, and so you'll be able to view it on yeah. your iPhones and your and but your iPads. The specific answer is not yet. Not yet, which is fine. It's we coming. really are way down the road here. Absolutely, I can wait for the other, and I'm sure it'll cost us a little money. But uh, no, no, actually, you guys would, and that's part of the once you once you implement this, that's that's part of the upgrade that would happen. Oh, yeah, when you guys excellent like that kind of stuff. All right, Mr. Silvas. Uh, this Neptune software is part of HD Supply Waterworks. Is that who we're dealing with? Is that who integrated this? HD Supply is our distributor for the local area. Um, Charlie is our is our Neptune rep, but but that's who who you guys purchased from as a is a city. So then the thirty five thousand dollar price tag on it. No, no, different well, issue. Did There's I look no at the I, I looked at the wrong line? Price. What was the price on this? There, the software, which would normally cost seventy-four thousand four hundred dollars, mm -hmm. there's no charge for. The only charge that there's going to be for this, uh, Mr. Silvis, is there's eleven thousand nine hundred dollar annual hosting fee. All of this is hosted on their server somewhere. Nothing the city has to buy, and another twenty-nine hundred dollars annual web portal hostage, which is basically a, a maintenance so for little. their stuff. So. We're fourteen thousand eight hundred dollars annually, and we don't have to pay for upgrades or the initial software. And then you guys would be the the backup. I mean, if something went wrong, you you're the IT guys. Uh, we, we we had all all uh, IT administration. Uh, it, it prevents you from having to hire a, a database administrator, um, servers within the utility, uh, and, and additional staff. So we handle all of that for you. And Ricky, I was really surprised to, to find out here that I thought the AMR conversion was way past the 50%. I didn't realize we were just there. We're so about 63%. So we are, and I thought he was even higher than that, but, you know, that's no. just. Uh, so how does this convert over to the, how, how do you pick up the, the AMR readings? How do you guys do it? What, what happens? Yeah, you got that. All right. So you have your, um, what we call our AMI system. Um, which is an advanced metering infrastructure system, which is our operational system that the utility uses. Readings come in through the data collectors. Um, they're processed. Then every night we package up that information 
and, and send it over to, to this system that I showed you today, which is our Inside IQ uh, customer web portal. So that's a daily feed. So we feed the information from our operational database to our um, customer web portal each night. Okay. So, Ricky, is there a set number of years that we're going to be paying this $14,000? Uh, is yes, there that's, a contract? That's is there? My understanding is that's for as long as we have yes. the service. So just that's it's an ongoing yeah. yearly fee. Is there a contract that we're signing? Yes. But no number of no specific number of years there's some reason that the city should choose not to do it anymore and that states it in the contract we can just drop yeah yeah right I mean this is something that is a yearly annual thing just like you're buying annual maintenance for any product mm -hmm. if you decide that's not what you want then it's it, you know it's it's cut at that time but so. You know, what Paul mentioned was that URL. Isn't it going to be a link onto the San Angelo, Texas US? Correct. Well, what would happen is you would, um, you would, you could go to the San Angelo utility website and have a, a, a link there that you clicked on to view your usage and it would direct them to whatever URL that you guys chose. We would um, point it to, to our servers, but they would see that view my water bill or what it, dot com or whatever it, it wanted to, yeah, you guys wanted to have. That's another so. good one. Yeah. So that's, that's something they can memorize and go. Okay. Mr. Morrison. Let me explain <coughs> where I'm coming from here. I was against these automated meters when they were first introduced, and I voted against them every time I had an opportunity. And in my humble opinion, I think they've done nothing but cause bad readings. I think they've cost our water users a tremendous amount of extra money and I think they've created tremendous problems for our water department and I've got the emails to back this up so I just give you that just to give you an idea of, of where I am and obviously I was the lone vote on this because everybody else agreed with them but I don't like them I don't want them and I'd rather go back to where we were that said when this program was sold to us that was one of the main things that was spoken of is that we will have all of this information we will be able to see all of this information and when there is a leak in anybody's house we've got this in city and we will be able then to notify our citizens that they're having excessive leaks that there's water being used and this was all sold to us as part of the program now we understand it's going to cost our water customers an additional $14,800 a year just to have this service when it was already sold to us as part of the original package. So I, I don't have much use for this program. I have it from the beginning and still don't. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farmer. I did have two questions. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, here we go. <laughs> I passed too late. I'm talking. Uh, the question being is the report you say you could go back a year on on your home and look at your comparative bill what it was the year before how you're doing what if I didn't uh, own that home or I had renters in that home are you going to be able to give me that previous history minus whoever name it was that lived there before are you able to give that previous history the history portion of this will this software will store three years of information, and, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get to your question. But as history is built, I mean, when you first sign on, you're not going to have last year's history. I mean, as you build history, you will be so able to see it. So you're not loading previous history. You're starting well, from the get-go. Well, that's an option for a fee that we can load up to six months, I think. Or okay. Well, we can, well, depending on what you want to cost. I think the real question, what she's trying to find is, will you will you store and maintain and have access to the history of that meter yeah that's not my history but that meter. that's a good question we um we actually uh there's an associate disassociate process that happens and what what we have found is most utilities only want the homeowner to have uh, visual representation of their usage not the previous individual so we we once you sign up we only show when the utility shows that you are effective in that house at that particular time so once they do their um, move in move out transaction whatever they do in the billing system that's that's when when your account becomes active and when you start seeing usage so you would not see the prior 
individual that lived in that house's usage. Hmm. And the reason it, it's more of a security risk, you start looking at it, it, if you know that individual, you look at patterns, when, when they were at home, when they were not at home. So that, that's, that's, that's the reason behind sure. most and of that. And privacy. Correct, correct. Thank okay. you. I, I just want to clarify. Okay, Mr. I wanna, Alexander. I want to agree with Mr. Morrison. I want to disagree with Mr. Morrison. I'm going to agree with Mr. Morrison that we don't really know what happened because we didn't have an investigation. We don't have something we can look at and say, well, this is where the problems were. This is why we had these water bill problems. We don't have that. So I agree with him on that. This is not your fault. But I'll tell you, I like to always let people know what really is going on. And Neptune came in in October and did an audit, the procedural audit with the water department about how their system integrates with ours. And I think there's nine components to a water bill. Is that right? Is there nine? So there's a lot of components to a water bill. Neptune's one. And they reviewed with our city staff how all this works to make sure we're doing our part right and that we're not messing up. So I know you guys came in and did that. And it, and it may or may not solve problems. I'm not sure about that part. But uh, it, it's not necessarily your fault. There's a, it's a very complex model. And I just want to make sure that the citizens know that this is a, it's a difficult deal. And, and, but we don't know what happened. Okay, Mr. Morrison. And that still does not address the fact that we were told three years ago when we voted for these these uh, automatic meters that this would be something that would be provided to our water users by our city and now we're being told you can get it but it's going to be for a fee we're going to there's a fifteen thousand dollar annual fee that our water department will have to pay which will be passed on to our water users this was sold to us that it would be included in the automatic meters. Now we find out it's going to cost us more. And if we want other apps, then there is an additional fee, and it, it, it never ends. Is that true? The last part is not true, right? So that's my problem. We, <coughs> we've already been sold this, this, this concept once, and now we're being sold it again. Now, now I will address the $15,000. There is You have the choice not to, to have Neptune host it. But and to purchase your server or whatever it may be, but but you're going to look at, you know, a lot more money than that. But but we were told initially that the city would have all of this information. They would have the information on hand. This was one of the wonderful selling points of this to start with. We've got this information. We can look on a daily basis at all the water usage. And if you've got a water problem and a water leak, we're going to notify that water customer and let him know that there is a water leak. But now we find out that this is going to cost us money. Uh, hang on. I don't hang remember on, that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I remember being available. It's going to be a feature that's available. They're answering questions. And, and he's doing a, <laughs> he's doing a good job. What he, okay. What, there's a difference here between getting the information, having the information, and where the information is. And and a big part of what, what you're buying here is putting it on their server, having them do the upkeep, having them take care of everything so that your IT people don't have to find a place on a server to put it. You don't have to have the storage capacity to keep it and you don't have to pay uh, for the upkeep of it. And so this is, there's, there's a slight parsing of what Mr. Morrison is describing here. We are getting the information as part of what we bought. Correct. Now what we're talking about is where is that gonna, information going to reside? Yeah, we're taking are it to the next willing, level, are basically. Are we willing to pay for that to reside somewhere else so that it doesn't put extra burden on our own infrastructure resources and our own IT people? So I, I mean, I think we're okay there. Now, let me try to, to move us to, this says, and any action in connection thereto. I'm looking for a motion to, to approve. approve this, okay, uh, and to allow Mr. Dixon to move forward with this process. I have a motion and a second to approve and move this thing forward. Do I have any further comment or question from council? I have one last one. Mr. Silva. for clarification. <coughs> Back in June, June 1, 2010, we entered in contract with HT Supply Waterworks. Was this part of that contract? Was this Neptune software part of that autom automatic meter read system that we had implemented? I believe that the software was part of the program for the utility or our usage. I cannot speak of if the customer portal portion was part of that agreement. Mr. Dane? It's, it's, I think it's important that we clarify you're not 
you're not being charged for software at this point. No. no. We're utilizing software. What we're being charged for is hosting. Let's let's clarify that. Would you cover that again? Yes. Yeah, so so the the annual charge is hosting and maintenance. So that that covers your and I and I I don't know if uh, and I'll kind of read so I don't I don't leave anything off. That is um, three years of 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 storage which is you're talking about billions of rows of data uh, ability to have alerts sent to the customer um, it also um, we handle all that database administration you know instead of you had going out and hiring a, a database administrator paying him you know typically those guys are hundred hundred thousand dollars a year jobs uh, we handle that uh, we handle all database maintenance and management whether it be you know if routine maintenance um, something were to go down we handle that we also host that information on, on servers for you to, uh, to, to keep you from having to do that, as well as any phone support from the utility calling in to, to Neptune for assistance and, and help, and any, free, any software upgrades uh, in the future, such as uh, mobile applications and things like that. So, Mayor, I think it would be accurate to say this, is, this proposal is a privatized methodology or has a, a methodology consistent with a privatized service. In other words, instead of us doing it, we are contracting for others to provide to do the it. service. Yeah, it's Mr. called software as a service is, is what that, what that is. S well, since Will Wildey's not here to answer my question, maybe Tony Fox will remember. Tony, do you remember this software being a part of the automatic meter read system when we first were implementing them? I mean, Tony seems to be one of the senior members there, and she is in charge of billing uh good morning uh unfortunately i was not involved with the negotiations that were going on at that time i'm so still lost on why you're asking about well, software the software the software is being provided you're not paying for it the software is a seventy four thousand dollars that you're not paying and, for and i guess what you're my paying for is the hosting of it on a server okay. so you're not buying software the right. software is provided and so you, I don't understand if you well, don't understand I'm trying to get clarification of what Mr. Morrison is saying that this automatic meter reading system that we are implementing that we are at 63 percent into had this had the capability to do this what we're doing here the Neptune software what it's doing what it's going to be capable of, that the AMR system not uh, was it not going to be able to give us this information is my simple question it, it, it gives that information currently but the problem is it's hard for and I, I don't want to speak for mr. Dixon to respond to 37,000 customers with his staff so this just allows them to be able to to notify them of that happening what, what you're paying for is utilization of the information in the most efficient in the most cost restrained manner that's what you're paying for I mean you're paying for the utilization of the information not for getting the information the information is there so you're not buying something you already bought the information is there what you're doing now is saying we'd rather they have it they keep up with it they hold on to it and they update it uh, and and we not have to bring that into our IT process so that's I we mean, couldn't do this on our own no. Why couldn't a citizen that wanted this information call the water department and say, I want to know how many gallons I've used since you were supposed, according to when it was sold to us, we were going to make those automatic notifications. If we're not doing that now, why couldn't our citizen call and say, I am Joe Blow, I live at this address. Would you look at your system and tell me how many gallons I used on February the 3rd? Could you not do that? You certainly could. Then why are we spending $15,000 a year? Because, to because we don't have the personnel to handle because that Because you would spend calls. another 40000 for the person that you're asking to handle that instead of fifteen. That's a Mr. cheap person. Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Farmer and then Mr. Alexander. I oh. Mr. Mayor, I remember it the, the way you, that you had described. I, I remember Harold telling us that we would have the ability to do exactly what you're saying once we get to that point. Uh, you're offering us that ability. We can say yes or no, and that's what was the way I remember it. That's what we presented, but I think Mr. Silvis's question could easily be answered if we went back 
at the time the AMI discussion was and look at the minutes and see what is there. Well, I'll be glad to check that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to accept this uh, and to allow Mr. Dixon to, to move forward with it. And so I'm going to uh, uh, move us to public comment and then call for a vote. So public comment on this item. Jim Turner again. One of the things you have to remember is we're also right in the middle of redoing the entire city website. So in a way, this is we either have them set up this portal for us that will eventually become part of the new city website, or we'd have to take and contract this out if we want this information to be available on the Internet. The second thing is, in a lot of ways, it's, this seems to me that this is also very similar to the voice response system that you just approved in that you have a, an automated system. This time it's on the Internet. The previous one was on a telephone system. Dealing with routine customer matters without having to have somebody, a human, actually do the routine stuff that a machine can actually do pretty well and do better. We have had a number of stumbling blocks, a lot of rest edges in doing the transition from what we did have to what we have now. There's a lot that needs to be addressed in that, a lot that needs to be learned. But what we're paying for here seems to me is a way to access the data that was already part of the contract on an ongoing basis and in next year or three years when we redo the website again we may decide to, to roll this into an overall contractor that one contractor is responsible for all the internet pr uh, presence including this but that's this is a good way to do it right now especially since you've already let the contract for the website redesign that didn't include this if you're going to have this on the website you either have a company like neptune do it or you go get an outside company to do it, or you spend a lot of money to develop that capability in-house that doesn't exist right now. Thank you. Thank you. Further public input? Okay. Call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Two nays. Okay. So you have a four to two vote. Okay. At this time, I'm going to take us into break. It's 12-12, and so we... I. Uh, I need to confer a little bit to get an idea of how what kind of how many items we have and how long we'll be in executive committee and I'll try to give you some idea of when to come back but it's gonna it's gonna be oh I'm gonna say 1:30 uh, without getting any any further knowledge than that uh, mr. Ramirez do you have an idea of how many <coughs> items are on the executive committee Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick by that 1.30 is when I think we'll start again. And so we will start again at 1.30 with item number 12 and move forward from then. Thank you. Okay, you guys, let me read this language, please. Don't, don't leave, don't anybody leave before I get through or I'll lose my quorum. This is uh, moving us into executive session. It's 12.14 p.m. Uh, this is the executive session, moving into executive session under the provision of the government code, Title V, Open Government Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exceptions to the Requirement that Meetings Be Open, Section 551.071, to consult with an attorney on a matter uh, related to the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct at the State Bar of Texas, uh, related to our landfill, and then an, an item under 551.072 to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property, uh, and, and uh, under item number 551.087 to discuss an offer of financial or other incentive to a company that we're conducting economic development negotiations with. Okay, we can move into executive session. Thank you all. Folks, I'm going to skip to item number 16, call the meeting back to order. It's 116, and do this item on the discussion and consideration of a petition seeking annexation 
uh, to San Angelo city limits of certain properties situated immediately west and southwest of San Angelo. Presentation by our interim senior planner, Jeff Hintz. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, as you stated, this is a consider a petition for possible annexation. We wouldn't actually be annexing any property by action that you took today. This would only uh, direct staff to look into that and uh, bring that back to you. We'd also ask if you are inclined to go ahead and approve this uh, petition to adopt the uh, schedule with it as well that would have the hearings that required for that. Um, as I stated for that, uh, this property is directly west of some property that was finalized for annexation on March 5th, and I've got some maps here. I can highlight that to you. Uh, the proposed timetable for this, uh, the first public hearing, if the petition were accepted today, would be for May 7th. Uh, second public hearing would be on the 21st of May. And uh, the first reading, which is spelled wrong, my apologies, uh, would be for June 4th, 2013. And the final reading of an ordinance annexing the property could be as early as June 18th. Um, again, this is the property here. This is a survey of it. The property that was recently annexed is here. You may know uh, the Boulevard Apartments that are being constructed currently, or Twin Buttes, I think is their current name, are just north of this property. This is an addition of the Preston Wood subdivision that we've had um, in the past. Um, there's an unannexed area of the city over this way as well, and I've got um, a map here that kind of shows where Sherwood Way is. Uh, you'll find the Sam's Club up this way. Uh, it's actually, the Sam's Club is here, and there's the Wendy's and the other establishments here. Um, an aerial photo is much better. There's some storage units and other things in the area, but this will just be a continuation of the neighborhood if council were inclined to go ahead and accept this petition for annexation. So we annexed the piece just inside it. Correct. If you can see where the city limit line runs here, the maps haven't been updated yet, but they'll leave a little hole over here. This property is currently right. not in the city limits, but this area here where I'm moving the mouse we over just was, annexed. was annexed as of March 5th. Yes. Okay. Jeff, how high is that, foot le that, that level there? Uh, the scale on this, I think yeah. I did one inch at a thousand feet. I'm not That's sure. That's a thousand feet. W one inch on the map is a thousand feet. I'm not sure how high the plane was. Okay, because I, I, li I don't like thirty-five thousand or twenty-six thousand. I like this. So when we talk about thirty-five thousand foot level, I'm pretty sure that's, that's twenty-two thousand. Okay. Twenty-two thousand five hundred miles. I think okay. that's what that I is. I just want to clear. Just keep so you know. the scale there. Okay, thank you. No problem. I'm glad you clarified that. <coughs> Been into the survey, so. Go ahead, sir. so if, if there's any questions, I can certainly address those Would now. Would you guys like to direct staff to start looking into the annexation of yes. this property? Yes. Uh, we, we also I asked you to include the, um, that proposed timetable as well. Would you need a motion? Would someone make a motion to? Would you go to back to the, the timetable? I'll second time that motion. Table. Right there. Well, you need a second. We have a motion to Miss Farmer. We have a motion to approve the existing timetable that is proposed by staff and to uh, approve the annexation. Approve looking approve into looking the annexation. Looking yes. into. I guess one thing I should point out that I failed to, my apologies, there's no special meetings required by this council. These will all be during regular council dates, so you won't have to schedule any special hearings for this as well. Okay, I have a motion to uh, give staff permission and direction to look into the annexation of the of the uh, land that he showed us in <coughs> using this proposed timetable. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, I have a second from Mr. Silva. Do I have other comments from council? Just keep that aerial foot level. You know. Okay, do I have any public second. input on this item? Let me call for this vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's item 16. Again, I'm, can, I'll go back to... Can I ask a related yeah. question? <coughs> that little pocket that's in there, and I, I know A.J. brought it up before. Is there something we can do to approach the current owner? I mean, is you that... You mean this, this pocket here? Yes. Yeah, the, these annexations here that we've done here and the one that was just approved now were um, under Texas state law. If it's less than a half a mile wide and there's less than three registered voters... Um, they can go ahead and petition the city, and it's a, f a faster process. Uh, as council, you could say, you know, we want to just go ahead and annex that, and it's a much longer process, but you could do it. The alternative would be if someone, you know, if the property owner came forward, and it would be a similar process to these recent annexations here in terms of the time frame. I, I guess my point is, could, could someone from staff approach? Uh, we, we could certainly, um, we've got the mailing address, we could certainly, um, you know, address a letter uh, to them and state that areas around them are being annexed and, and do it that way. Um, we'd have to look into the legality of it. It would, it would be more of an informational letter we couldn't force them to unless, you know, you directed us to, but we could certainly send them something about the 
you know, the, what's Mr. going Mr. Alexander, on aren't you familiar with the landowner? Yeah, I'm, I'm over here trying to get trying to find the email that Bob Hicks sent me saying that our church, Community Hills Christian Church, sold that land about two months ago, and my dad, as trustee, signed it. It's now a new owner. So okay. that's what I know. I, I, he told me who it is, and I can't find the email. Okay. Well, I think we might could get this done via either – Mr. Alexander or possibly Miss Farmer, where they would just write a note and ask if there's interest. Correct. We've it's annexed it's property all around you. Do you have any interest in being annexed? It's, it's much faster if the property owner approaches and seeks to be annexed, unless it's you know the city council could say we want to annex that property. It's it's just about the time. Write the letter, I'll sign it. It's my district. Yeah, I'm not really I'm not really after telling them. I'm st I'm trying to suggest that sure. they look into it. That's you understand yeah, that. They, they had to They would have to request it. When right. we do as staff, someone comes to us, in this example, they'd given us a meets and bounds description and a plat of the property, so a surveyor will have to go out there and draw something up. And then uh, a letter of intent saying, I'd like to have this property that I've described here annexed into the city limits. Then it's just notarized, and at that point, we send out the publications and bring it before you yeah. for action. So no one can send a friendly letter of just, just to let you know we can this is what's happening. We, we can check just into it to see, certainly. That's not okay. a problem. It's just not good having a uh, donut hole in there. Agreed. I, as a council member of that district, I've noticed that <coughs> we have annexed everything except that small pocket. That's why I don't understand why that's a problem. Well, well, neither. Said, well, we're not We're not threatening you with annexation but wonder if but you would just consider I noticed it. that it's, it's consider the coming forward yeah in, in terms of you know development of the property if it was you know you mentioned it was recently transacted in order to you know have city sewer and water the subdivision ordinance states that you shall request annexation so development of the property may be a little more you know problematic without that annexation certainly okay <coughs> uh, looking there's mr. Schneeman I'm trying to get to 1.30, folks. Uh, like, I know the Myers are here. I'm trying to get to 1.30 because that's when I said we would kick off again. So anybody that wants to be here for item 12 can be here. So I'm trying to take items that don't affect people to kill to get time taken care of. So we'll get after it. And okay. Mr. Schneeman, would you come walk us through number 17, the consideration of adopting a resolution ratifying the filing of an application by the City of San Angelo Development Corporation with the Texas State Energy Conservation Office. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I don't actually have a presentation on this. Um, I think all the uh, information was in your packets. But basically, um, a member of the Costa DC board became aware of the availability of some grant funds through the State Energy Conservation Office to install uh, uh, auxiliary power systems, if you will, um, solar energy. Uh, we looked at a number of buildings uh, throughout the city. Our initial interest was in doing this on the roof of the Business Resource Center to offset our, our own utility costs on that building. That building proved not to be um, a particularly good candidate because of the size of the roof, the equipment that was on the roof, um, other structures around. So uh, we then let the consultant uh, look at a number of buildings and they came up with the uh, Spur Arena being a, um, a, a good candidate for this. Um, the state has about two million dollars available. Uh, they're looking at doing grants in the amount of about two hundred fifty thousand dollars if you get the full grant. So there would be about eight of these. So we're in it should be a fairly tight competition, I guess. Uh, one of the main things was that the um, grant needed to be submitted by the 15th of March. So we could not get it to council before that. Uh, we discussed it with COSA DC, went ahead and, and submitted the grant application. We're not obligated, even if we are awarded the grant, we're not obligated to accept the grant. So um, if we were to get the $250,000, there would be about 62,000 in matching funds. Estimates are um, that we would save about $1,000 uh, per month in uh, uh, utility fees. This is a behind the meter connection, so uh, if we generate more power than we use, it goes back into the grid, we get a credit for that. 
So even though the Spur Arena may not use the entire amount uh, that could be produced here, uh, it could offset some other utility costs at uh, the rodeo grounds. Again, we're not uh, obligated to accept the grant uh, if we're approved. Uh, and there are some questions we'd still like to ask. Okay, and you're not, the only thing I haven't heard you talk about is that electric vehicle charging station, so tell me more. The consultant told us, and I specifically asked about that, the consultant tells us that in order to maximize the available eligibility points for the grant, we needed to include at least one of those. Uh, what they're doing with a lot of cities is they're doing, uh, Austin for example, they're doing nothing but covered parking with solar panels on the top and nothing but charging stations. Those apparently look really good to the uh, Energy Conservation Office. We're, we're looking at a little different arrangement. I don't think there are a lot of, there's going to be a lot of demand for uh, electric vehicle charging stations at the rodeo grounds at this time. However, it may be that the rodeo grounds will over time buy some electric vehicles for use on the grounds and it may turn out to be a, a viable option yeah. but it's what's is there the, what's the cost of that station I, I don't have a breakout of that station specifically and Listen. additionally if, if if we're only awarded half of this then we're not committed to having to spend the whole thing and us make the difference right that's correct uh, one of the first things we did was discuss this with the city attorney and have her look at all the paperwork and we came to the conclusion we can turn it down flat if we don't want to do it that's the only reason that we went forward without uh, count with pre without pre-approval of council was we, because we had that option okay questions from mr. Morrison too many of these grants we're looking at have so many hooks in them uh, we need to be very, very careful here, and y'all need to really consider this that you know what you're getting into. I agree with you, sir. That's that's again. That's why we the first thing we did was go to the city attorney and say, look, what's our obligation here if we do get this? Uh, so. Other questions on the on the uh, presentation? Um, is there a let me look, 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 adopting a resolution, ratifying. So are we going to adopt a resolution or are we going to give instruction uh, to not to accept it and not to pay the $62,000 related to I think they filed the application, right. so. Well, what's this $62,000? Uh, and the, the matching. ratification of the application if first went to we get COSA the DC. Okay. So COSA DC's recommendation to you is in furtherance of the submission of the uh, right. application which is already done yes because hang of on the but <laughs> I mean again at the end of the day you can ratify something they've done you can also though he's made it very clear that they did it to meet a guide to meet a date deadline yes. and if you if you said I just don't really want we don't we don't want to participate in this we know you you know okay we ratify the fact that you sent the application in but that's the end of it. We don't so want to participate. Therefore, you're not going to then approve or, so to speak, ratify the filing of the application. And you would, in doing not ratifying it, then we would have to withdraw it. And at which point we would yes. withdraw the application. Okay. I make so a motion we table the indefinitely. Can we not the agenda item? Not table it, but just uh, don't do anything. Well, you you either ratify it so that it goes through the process. Yes. Right. What do you need? Or you refuse to ratify. He wants us to ratify it or refuse to ratify it. Correct. Mayor? I, my, my take is that we ratify it and then if we get the get the grant at that point then we decide whether we take it or not. When we have all our questions right. answered That's and everybody's right. comfortable but with right it. Right now there's a whole lot of questions so okay. I will make a motion that we That's what I'm looking uh, for. adopt the resolution mm -hmm. as presented. Yeah only for the filing for the filing of the that's, and that's that's all I'm application we would always come back to council to accept the grant money perfect adopt a resolution ratifying the filing of an application you make that that's motion it. motions made okay. Second. 
I have a second from Ms. Farmer. So I have a motion and a second that we, that we do uh, adopt a resolution ratifying the filing of an application. Okay. Now, Mr. Morrison. Have we spent any money yet? No, sir. Will we spend any money before we make a decision on this? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Did you tell us how much it's going to save us? How much energy is this going to generate? It's about $1,000 a month uh, is the estimate. So five and a half year payout. Well, uh, correct for our for our portion of the investment. But this a thousand. It's a savings of a thousand dollars electric uh, per month. But it's also perhaps even selling back to the grid. Also, that we don't know how much that might be on a. Uh, that that payback was was uh, calculated based on a, about a, a hundred uh, kW system. So that would be the sort of break even. We wouldn't we wouldn't probably we're not probably going to generate any more than okay. that. Okay, I have a motion and a second to uh, approve and and uh, sentiment that we that we understand that we get to look at it before we make a final decision. So, but anyway, the motion and the second approve the ratification. Do I have any further points from or questions or comments from council? Do I have public comment on this item? Okay, call for this vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, sixteen and seven. Thank you. Our electric bill. <laughs> Did we pay our electric Everybody bill? in the audience is fanning themselves, and it's I cool. <laughs> it's hot. Oh, I feel cold. God. You're sick. I feel I'm cold. Done. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> hot. I'm cold. Me. I'm cold. Cold. I'm <laughs> cold. <laughs> hot. Okay. I'm just watching the audience. I'm not the only one fanning themselves. It's uh, okay. Item number twelve. <laughs> they, they can. They'll look for us. Make sure that things are. Item number 12 is the first public hearing in consideration of introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Exhibit A, related to PD 07-01, uh, and this is the Meyer and Rosser uh, project and presentation by our uh, senior planner, Jeff Hens. All right, good afternoon. Uh, as you stated, um, this is the first introduction and reading of an ordinance. This is a request for approval of a zone change from Ranch and Estate to a planned development district that would allow for a campground and RV park as allowed in PD 0701 approved in March of 2007. This is at 3512 Ben Ficklin Road, about 200 feet east from the intersection of Ben Ficklin Road and South Bryant Boulevard. Uh, we did send five notices out, uh, one, re one that were required by law to the property owners within 200 feet. One of those was returned in favor and was included with the background packet along with several other letters we'd received. This is a map of the one that was returned in favor. Uh, the 200 foot kind of runs like this. I'm uh, sorry, Jeff, repeat that again, in favor of it? Uh, yeah, this is the one that was returned in favor of the mm -hmm. five we'd sent out. There were a couple in this area that were not returned to us at all. Uh, just a map of the area kind of to show you, you know, where it is. South Bryant Boulevard runs uh, this way through town. Uh, the Century Terrace um, subdivision is this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and South Chadburn Street heads out towards the base uh, along the river here. A little bit closer view of the zoning. You can see there's some commercial zoning in this area, office commercial zoning, as well as uh, residential and ranch and estate back near the river here. Uh, heading north into the subdivision, you get RS1 and some other commercial properties along South Bryant Boulevard. Uh, looking at an aerial photo of the property, again, you can see it is uh, farmland at this time. The applicants are here and can certainly explain more their you know, intent for the project, but this would be intended to be a type of a phase two or a, f a first phase of their already approved. Um, if you can see the PD on here, and I've got another map later on that'll elaborate that a little bit better. Um, there's already an approved PD on the book that allows for a campground and RV park on this property, as well as some leased property from the city in this area as well. This is simply applied those same rules and those same regulations to this development here a little bit closer to uh, ben Ficklin Road and then Bryant just off the screen here, but it would apply it to this approximately 10 acres of property here. Um, here's a couple photos of it. Ben Ficklin Road in this area is not uh, utilized very much. There's no development in this area uh, at all. There's uh, a couple billboards and some other properties. The Red Arroyo was just up here. There's a drainage that runs through there. Uh, this is looking east across the subject property. If you can, if your eyes are good enough and the TVs work well, you can see in the distance some phone lines here. That is uh, South Chadburn Street uh, across the property. The property as a whole is approximately 75 acres. The leased property from the city is around uh, 20 acres or so, if I, I believe. Um, and, and considering this, the council may approve the zone change as presented, uh, remand this back to Planning Commission for further discussion, or deny the zone change. Staff recommended approving this. Uh, amendment to PDO 701. There is a site plan which I'll get into later on. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of this request by a vote of 5 to 1 at their meeting on March 18th. 
Uh, the area is generally undeveloped. There's a few residences in the area. In terms of the placement within the city, this is a really um, isolated area. There's not a lot of development in this area whatsoever. And given you know what we went through this morning with the joint meeting with the Planning Commission, you may be wondering you know why this is here um, before you today. This is the one that we've had an application for that meets the intent of the current ordinance. It is for tourist boarding. There's allowances for some horse riding on this property as well within the PDO 701. Um, staff has found with the current regulations we have in place this particular project is meeting the intent of the current ordinance. Um, these are the criteria for approval for a zone change as with all the other zone changes staff did find these to be uh, true for this particular request. Um, the traffic capabilities of the area uh, were discussed with TxDOT as both of those uh, right-of-ways that are near the property are TxDOT right-of-ways on Bryant and Chadbourne. Um, the main entrance to this will be off of the Ben Flicklin Bryant side. Um, TxDOT had no complaints about either side when I talked with them about this. Um, staff did find this to be the highest and best use of the property. A lot of this property is within the floodplain. It's not to say that development of properties in the floodplain is impossible altogether, but in terms of doing it, there's more things to go through and additional permits you'll need to you know, place permanent structures on the property in the you know such a manner that would you know really make this profitable. Um, staff did find you know, a campground and RV park on this property to be very useful. Um, temporary vacationing and recreational use fits with our current vision plan of the area for open space and neighborhood in this area, as well as the zoning ordinance definition of what a campground is at this particular time. We found little effect would occur to the natural environment and development patterns of the area as well, given the isolation within the community and from the properties nearby. Um, the PD is already approved 800 feet east on the same property as we looked at on the map before. Um, in terms of zoning and predictability of consistent development, that's really the goal of the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance. Uh, staff found that a PD in this case is the most predictable and most consistent and probably the best way to go about doing this. Uh, the same rules and regulations will be applied on this particular property, the 10 acres subject to this request. They've been in place since 2007 on the city leased property and the other property that was shown on the map. Uh, there is a specific site plan with this particular ordinance that must be adhered to. Uh, amendments to that would require approval from Planning Commission and eventually this board. Um, and we found this property to be unique from any other request for this type of use that staff has seen so far. Uh, and here's the site plan. There's a much better one in your digital packet um, that you can zoom in and play around with. But basically, Ben Ficklin Road is here. Um, this will be, the applicants are here and can explain their intent, of course, but it would be paved and have to meet all the permitting and fire code requirements. Um, there's a, an office laundromat here and a type of pavilion here, a recreation area, as well as the proximity of the Aretta Arroyo and the Concha <laughs> River. We really found this an ideal spot in the community to have a temporary, say, campground. This would not be a, a permanent <coughs> living situation whatsoever. Uh, and with that, if there's any questions that you have of me, I'll be happy to try and uh, address those as best I can. Questions for Mr. Hintz regarding the presentation? I've got a quick one. Jeff, Mr. on Silvers? one of the slides I noticed there's a piece of land that's adjacent to the river. Uh, I guess it was zone PD. Right there. Um, right there. That one right there. Who owns that? That's uh, The city owns that, and they have a lease for that particular property. They have a lease, so. So then they... And then th this this piece of pro there's a property line that runs through here. This part of the PD is on their property at you know at this time, um, and there's um, a mobile home out here that's allowed to be placed there to be used as a only as an office for the um, for this particular development. Now there is a con this has been before you several times um, over the course of the last five or six years. Um, if the site is not fully developed and it gets a cutoff date, I think it was recently extended to uh, 2016. If the site is not fully developed, the mobile home must be removed. But if the site is developed, it is allowed to remain there as a living quarters for the folks taking care of this particular park. But this would strictly be an RV park. This would be a, a campground RV campground. park. Yeah. And the, the, the previous PD allows for some uh, horse boarding activities to occur near the river and the Red Arroyo up this way, as well as some, some type of cabins as well are also included in the PD that could be developed. I believe it calls for this area. I don't have a, so a slide of the old site Who plan. owns a property where that subject... Where that, th that's, yeah. that's their property as well. That's right it. now it's, it's agricultural use. There's some fields, and they can elaborate more on you know what they're okay. doing with that. But, but they own that. They, they own the property up to this. Um, you see where this black line kind of runs Probably through the here. Red Royal. ends up here. Yeah, they, they own the property up to that. So th we're, we're just giving them access to, if approved, to that 10-acre. Right. Uh, ben Ficklin Road runs through here, and there's, right. there's, a, there's a driveway they've got there. Um, I, I may have a photo of that. Uh, it's the driveway is just off the screen yeah, here, I've but they've it. got they've got access, and this is the house and mobile home that's out there. Okay, thank you. 
Other questions of Jeff? Would you like to talk to the uh, proponents? Questions for them? or This has been quite some time in coming. Uh, what is it? Was it 07, 09? Yes, 07. 07 since it first 07. initiated. Is there a time frame? Uh, w with the zone change, it's on the books forever unless they were to come and request a zone change to something else. But this is on, it's a zone change and anybody they could you know, sell it to me if I bought that property and I'd have to follow the exact same set of rules, but there is no time frame for expiration on this. I am going to make a motion for approval of this item. Okay. As I'll second. listed. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve as presented. Uh, do I have further questions from council? Absolutely. Don't don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do I have any anything else from council? Okay. Now I would I do want to bring up public input on this item. Go ahead. If there are going to be several speak, it'd be nice if you'd come up close to the front so that uh, as the next as one person leaves, you can you can come in right behind them. Okay. This is that petition that we did, and I just have two. Hello, Hi. I'm Terry Jackson, and I am a homeowner at Century Park, and uh, we have a petition copy of it for each of you to look at. There were 44 property owners Terry, that have signed the petition. Just a moment, because he has the opportunity to kind of show us where y'all are. Okay. Do you mind if, if we don't get sure. let him do that? Jeff, will you back that up to show us where, where uh, Century Park is? We're right there. Okay. So Thank we are you. within the 1,200 feet from the plan development. Okay. Um, in this, we, we realize that there is already the approved plan development that was in 2006. Um, and our concerns are, of course, property values that we talked about this morning with RV and uh, campground sites close to homes. This is or could be, um, it's a different zoning type from the ranch and estate that it has been into the plan development and the original plan development that was approved in 2006 has never been developed so we have that as Ms. Farmer indicated from 2006 nothing has been done until now and um, so we're going to extend it and make it larger it does not make a lot of sense to us um, anyway that I just you have our, our um, petition that we had and the property owner signatures on there and then of course the, the maps that behind it that show the proximity to us. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. <coughs> you ready? Yes, just a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Peggy Rosser. Good morning, Council. Good afternoon, Council. Good morning. Good afternoon. Initially, we would like to publicly compliment A.J. Favre and Jeff Hintz for their commitment to San Angelo. Their dedication to their job is evidenced through the remarkable level of work that they have consistently exhibited through this entire process. Thank you, Jeff and AJ. Today, we're requesting the council's approval to amend our current plan development, PD 0701, which was passed in March of 2007. We want to amend the PD. I wanna share just real quickly how it came to even exist. Carrie and I were members of the 2006 Leadership San Angelo class and during one of those presentations, we were able to visit the Hummer House in Cristoval. And Dan Brown at the Hummer House was saying, he said, you know, I think that we, that San Angelo could really use another RV park. Now remember, this was in 2006. And like the good ex-school teacher I am, I was sitting on the front row, and Carrie was on the back row with her friends. And I turned to her and I went, we can, we can do this. And the idea was born. We are not a flash in a pan. This has been our goal 
it's been to build an RV park. This Google Earth picture shows the area from 2,000 feet. Notice the yellow lines. They mark the entire location. This parcel of land sits between South Bryant and South Chadburn and also between the Red Arroyo and the South Concho River. As the Google Earth image is closer, the area marked in the red shows the current plan development 0701 boundaries that were approved in March of 2007. We are requesting that the current plan development 0701 as indicated by the blue line be approved. This plan development amendment intersects the already approved plan development. This is the engineering plat for that piece of land. This is the second drawing of it because we made some changes which were necessary to adhere to various regulations. This slide shows the approach to the park, which is ideal because it's very visible. The slide shows the entrance from the north as marked by the green lines. Notice, RVers will have a turning lane, which will enable ease of access to the entrance gate. And it's marked on this slide as well. When an RV is entering from the south, as indicated by the purple arrows, notice that there is ample area for them to turn and then to enter the park gate. That large pink arrow up near the top is an emergency entrance gate to the park, which is a requirement. Upon exiting the park, again, all the traffic is visible. If traveling north, the driver will be able to utilize the area prior to South Bryant to prepare to enter the northbound traffic flow as indicated by the blue arrows. When entering the traffic flow southbound, there is an area available for them to cross the northbound lane and join that traffic pattern. As has been visually noted, RVs entering and exiting the RV park will not be using Ben Ficklin Road and will not need to cross the bridge at the Red Arroyo. Therefore, there will not be a need for the city to address widening that bridge. The park engineer has received verification that the water and sewer connections for the park are easily accessed on Ben Ficklin Road and of proper size to handle our park. The water and sewer connections for the park are the park owner's responsibility. Again, there will not be a need for the city to hire extra employees because of the park's connections to water and sewer. The approval of this amended PD will not, in and of itself, cause the city to hire additional fire, police, or city personnel. The South Bryant Corridor is home to many other like businesses. Angelo RV is on the north. Cristobal Estates is located just south of our property on the corner of Chadburn Street and Cristobal Road. Angelo RV Storage Only is just south of our property, along with Angelo Truck and RV and Riverbend Estates. South Concho RV and Mobile Home Park is just west of South Bryant. <coughs> Our 
what Carrie is bringing to you all is our paper clip together set of letters of support I will address these letters of support one at a time by providing some quotes from them. Since the approval of the plan development 0701 passed in March of 2007, the Chamber of Commerce continues to support Concho River RV Resort. In his letter, Phil Neighbors says, due to its beautiful location, the permanent asset planned as Concho River RV Resort will fill a tourism need for years to come. Thank you for your careful consideration of this proposed plan development that will be a great asset to San Angelo. The next letter, in addition to Phil Neighbors, Pamela Miller with the San Angelo Convention and Visitors Bureau supports the project as well. And I quote her, obviously the top priority for a Convention and Visitors Bureau is to book hotel rooms. But as our city continues to grow, there is a growing demand for RV parks from a tourism standpoint. There are many tourists who stay strictly at campgrounds and not in hotels. And not having sufficient campgrounds in our city merely sends them to stay in another city. The snowbirds that we get from the north are a perfect example of this, she goes on. Much of this business is currently going to Fredericksburg instead. We also received various event bidding specs that call for certain number of camping spaces. This is especially true in the areas of agricultural and equine tourism. The next letter is from Bill Brown with Angelo RV and he supports the project. I have been in the recreational vehicle business for several years here in San Angelo. The RV industry continues to steadily grow. Tourism is a big industry, and it brings increasing benef beneficial economic impact to those towns that cater to the RV lifestyle. Mr. Brown closes his letter with, I believe it is in the planning, in the council's best interest, in San Angelo citizen's best interest, to approve the amendment to the current plan district for Concho River RV Resort. Next, local business owner, Treva Boyd, owner of Angelo Truck and RV, RV, provides her support by saying, we small businesses bring a significant amount of tax dollars and valuable services to customers that shop here, choose to vacation here, or are just passing through. I hope that you will seriously consider allowing Concho River RV Resort a chance to build their facility thereby promoting another valuable small business to grow and thrive here. The next letter of support comes from Tom Thompson. He states his, ex his experience with current event planning by stating, the future availability of hotel and RV space is becoming a common discussion topic at nearly every event planning meeting. He continues, any steps to help reduce these short-term issues will certainly benefit all of San Angelo as we grow the next few years. Yes, sir. We have a clear flavor on the letters. Please move forward with the next I part will of your do presentation. That. The letters clearly support the fact that another RV park would be in the best benefit for San Angelo. We are ready to build and today we seek your approval to amend our plan development 0701 passed in March 2007. Thank you. Thanks. A couple of questions for you. Yes, sir. I, the, you, you've had this dream for a while and now you're reaching a point where you're trying to move forward with it. So tell me something about, you started in 07, this is 13. Why, what, what gets you to the point that you're ready to pull the trigger? In other words, is this an exercise uh, in this is about to happen or is this an exercise in we're dealing with something that we're telling others to study uh, and it's not about to happen? No, sir, it's about to happen. So tell me about the that. The economic climate, of course, is assisting this decision now, but we are all 
the Rossers and the Myers are at a much stronger place financially to move forward on this. But, but explain the move. It saves money. Utilities are closer to this site than the other. There's uh, water under the other site. There's there's problems. Well, but this I think well, at, well, maybe you, maybe okay. you can't say that last part. No, as we move forward, know. anytime you um, start this project, until you do engineering and your studies and learn, um, we're not contractors. We're not sewer and water utility people. Um, the complications um, with building a first phase on the river, one, it's on a lease land, which is harder to receive funding for and is restricted by banks whether okay. or not you can fund a project on lease property. And in 07, uh, there was a bank here, which was an SBA loan, and the SBA loan would loan on lease property where con conventional loans would not. Um, at the time of the ec uh, economy changing in 07, 08, um, the SBA was a little stringent on um, who they would give money to. By doing our first phase on deeded land closer to street access and water and sewer, funding options are more available to us. Thank you. My next question has to do with, uh, you were here this morning, so my next question has to do with um, how long people get to stay there, how, what, what your thoughts are about the fact that the rules may change. You're, you're about to invest a bunch of money, put something in, and then the rules are being developed we are concurrently. Bound, we are bound by the rules under the plan development, not by the special use zoning that you are looking at currently. The, okay. the rules built inside of our PD is what we have to go by. And those do mir mirror what your special use is, or are very similar to your special use currently. Tell me about how long someone can park uh, in the facility. The current the is currently written as stated this morning as an average of 30 days. And that being, you do have winter Texan people um, who will be here over 30 days. You have people who will be here one day. You have people who will be here a week. Um, the ordinance is written to allow people to utilize a park. If you start putting such stringent restrictions on it, um, you, your funding will be restricted because there are, when you go into the funding side of this, um, the SBA in particular, when we did that last time, only a certain portion of the park could be spaces that were 30 days versus seven days. Um, as an industry and um, for the conventions we have attended, there is um, lots of regulations within side of our industry that dictate how many KOA is um, partially 30-day spaces, partially weekly spaces, partially daily spaces because of the way KOA structures their campgrounds as a corporation, not as a local entity. Okay. Other questions for them? Yes. Ms. Farmer. What concerns me is the, uh, over the years, reasons have changed. When you first started out, uh, your reasons were to be strictly a recreational use facility with uh, horseback riding and et cetera and for so forth, and several of us on the council at that time were concerned about any type of contamination into the water since you have access down to the water on leased land from the city. Uh, this project, the plan development has been amended twice uh, for changes to accommodate uh, your request. Uh, one time uh, you said it was because of sicknesses and illnesses. When I called your hand on that, you know, it was no, it was because of businesses that uh, your person that he estimated what it would take to do the project uh, was considerably wrong, less than what it turned out to be to progress. And then you changed, uh, you came and wanted to put a mobile home unit on there uh, uh, strictly for purposes that you had stated in the mobile home was allowed to be there until March 2011. And then you came back and wanted that amended, the mobile home to remain until March of 2016 if it were a campground RV park uh, facility to use as an office. Uh, I'm confused from what you originally started and proposed to be, all of the different changes that are here. And now with the oil boom and the influx, I, I see it as trying to capture that cash cow right now. So I'm heavily inclined not to uh, vote for this because of all of the different changes and it just appears that we're just trying to tap into that cash cow market that's going on out there and that would be detriment to the Century Terrace properties and the other businesses that, that are out there. That's just my opinion. If we were 
um, held planning degrees, if we were engineers, maybe we would have done this right the first time. We are mere citizens working on a project as a small business to build something. Unfortunately, with that comes a learning curve. With that comes many changes. Um, yes, we had a huge medical condition in our family which economically impacted us. Um, the banks also were not lending money at the time. We tried to secure funding at the time and then I fell ill and was out of work for many months and the emotional roller coaster that rides with it. Um, you don't want to try to build something and go through that. So all of those yes are factors. But regardless, the question here is the property is a good use for an RV park. And um, this change will allow us to move forward now when we are in a strong economy where banks are lending money, when it makes sense to open a park when gas prices have somewhat stabilized in the economy and people are spending money traveling now where they were not um, back when we tried shortly after we started this last time. I am concerned that with the uh, problems that you've encountered and the changes that have been made, if something were to happen physically or uh, financially, that there wouldn't be deep enough to withstand and keep it a viable business. So I'm, we, I have concerns. And we recognize those concerns. We want to build an RV park. Um, my issue about the timing had to do with because we're getting this other work done I want I was uh, you know this is the amendment of something it's not in other words you don't we, we wouldn't have to pass this on under what was agreed to under 2007 if we chose not to pass it on it would be bringing it back and maybe having to uh, comply with the new rules and and that's why I'm trying to spend a little energy and I'm, I'm rereading some stuff that I read last night so uh, are there any other questions for them I just I guess make the only sure, one I want to make sure that whatever we do understand this I'm actually a proponent for you but I want to make sure that we do this this way and it's okay and then the next time someone asks the same kind of rules can apply and the next time someone asks and because I want us to be able to say yes or no based on some set of guidelines that we all can can uh, can live with as a community I don't want some winners and some losers and and we don't even have a real idea why why did this person win and that person lost or those kinds of things and that's a, so I was trying to understand a little bit what your timeline was to know whether or not getting through the whole process it hinders your success one way or the other we but anyway, started meeting with staff in November so don't you know we've already been working on this multiple months with staff okay mr. Morrison I approved you back in 207 I thought it was an excellent idea then and I've not changed my mind today I, I am interested are you ready to go yes we have to finish engineering because until you all approve us we're not going to pay for engineering again like we did last time but everything is set up, if the engineering is there and the approval is there, it's giddy yes. up. Yes. I don't have any problem with this. The only question I have, Mayor, is um, <coughs> as long as you folks can promise me that there will be no, and I guess there can't be, any mobile homes involved in this area? They are not allowed under the right. PD restrictions. That's what I wanted to hear that. Only the one for owner or management housing. And then what is, I've heard the average length of stay is around 30 days. What is the average longest stay, or is there such a thing? No. There's not. That depends. Um, you have people currently at your current parks that are staying much longer than 30 days. I have friends who have stayed at KOA for over a year. So you currently have those situations in place, which are not causing the city issues. You're not having policing issues. Your campgrounds have typically management that live on site. And by having someone live on site and have you know, m that is controlled better. We have a mobile home park in the county and nobody lives there. Nobody's around to see it on a daily basis. Here it's managed on a daily basis and you have office hours. Um, it is a different um, scenario than a mobile home park. It, how many parking spaces are there? I never did count them. F 51. 51. In this amendment. And you guys own all these others? We own an almost Close. 75 acres. And it oh, is I'm talking about the the other mobile home parks. I mean, no, 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 no sir. Oh, you're just no. Okay. What we were doing, we, we were showing comparable areas. Okay. Yeah. 
And I, I applaud the uh, effort of the Century Park. I had no idea there was issues there. You know, if I w if I'm the council person for this area, if somebody would have let me know that there was issues, then, you know, I'm not saying to be totally different, but at least I, I certainly hear their concerns. But uh, I was never contacted by anybody else other than Ms. Ms. Rosser was trying to get with me to meet down there. I took it upon myself, and I've driven that area many times, and I saw what was out there, and really, I had I had no issues with anything, uh, no noise, no wild parties out there. I'm sure it's all going to be controlled. I would hope, but uh, but again, I have I have no no issue. Thank you. One building, two buildings, tourist cabins, swimming pool, other recreation, parking spaces, horse trailers and light trucks, parking spaces for short term, stalls for horses. But I'm trying to find in here, it doesn't even necessarily say, and I, I need some help here. Does it, are they, they're under a planned development, but there's none of the language, for instance, about how long a trailer can be there in their planned development language. And so does the ordinance uh, with the average of 30 days apply or doesn't apply? Uh, correct you are in that fact that, um, I'll try to address your questions, correct you are that the ordinance does not specify, you know, this, that, or like you said, there's no time limit on the trailers. However, in the ordinance language at the top, um, it's a planned development district intended for a recreational vehicle park with tourist cabins and horse boarding. We would default back to that definition in the ordinance of the average 30 days um, under that case. But the, back in 2007, it was not specified. It says planned development district intended for a recreational vehicle park with tourist cabins and horse boarding. Right. And then we, we do have in the zoning ordinance, a recreational vehicle park is defined, and that's where you'll find the average length of stay as 30 days. Miss Bowling? I'm looking. I'd, I'm going to have to pull open the uh, ordinance. You guys, I'm very Chapter sorry 12. for letting this drag on, but the fact is I can't support it if, if they're not, if they're not re required to comply with that ordinance because this is wide open, the plan development district mm -hmm. working stuff is wide open and so I can't I can't support just this I've got to understand that they're gonna have to comply with that ordinance right. either either the it applies and in, in whatever case if it does then if we end up changing that ordinance then it applies still to them, applies to right to the recreation amended format vehicle the, we would fall back into the general definition or the general the Jeff definition in the ordinance under chapter 12 defining the recreational vehicle park for those restrictions and requirements and in those requirements so are specifically the answering the mayor's yes. question yes that applies to this PD that yes the ordinance applies to this plan development let me I'm as I said I'm going to pull up the chapter so I can answer you very specifically thanks okay. Jeff. What's chapter 12? An ordinance amending chapter 12? So of the, the code? As is the always, vehicle. the traffic on the, on the PD, does that? Christopher Road has really concerned me being right before the bridge. What says it's applicable? Yeah, they've got an entrance, front entrance, and a back entrance. See, it says it's applicable regulations contained in chapter 12 of the code. Thank you. I don't know if there's a back entrance, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a back entrance. I never saw a back entrance. Uh, Ms. Peggy, is there a back entrance? Christoval Road as well as... There's an emergency uh, entrance that I saw. We have an approach from TxDOT on Chadburn, not on Christoval oh, okay. Road. And that is um, intended as a secondary egress, ingress for the original PD as required by fire code. It is not intended as a main entrance to the facility. So there's a strong possibility that I've, if I bring in my RV and then I pull and bring my horse and trailer and pig and cow and roosters that 30 days later I might have to just haul everything out of there. There's a strong possibility, right? If they read it correctly. 
I'm reading your plan development again, and I think I, I, I think it says in section two of their plan development uh, district agreement that in all other respects, I think that may be enough uh, to be okay. I'm seeing it as an umbrella to everything else. What is that? Right. The Chapter definition really takes merging the, the definition under C of campground recreational vehicle to define what the characteristics of the recreational vehicle park are. However, the plan development district has its particular rules, and so um, it, it just would be <coughs> interpreting. So, so go ahead. So th here are these two. We've got the general definition, and we have the specific uh, set of rules for this. So, what? Take me further with your. Okay, my right. My position is that there's nothing in their plan development, planned development district document, mm -hmm. that restricts how long a a a, an, a recreational vehicle can be there. So if the ordinance doesn't govern an average of 30 days, and if that ordinance doesn't apply because they're in a planned development district, then there's no restriction on how long a, a recreational vehicle can be on their property because the planned development district document doesn't have any of that. that and is, I would be willing that to is a correct. That is a reasonable interpretation. I would be willing to pull my motion and add that 30-day restriction or is length of time but you that they can't, can be there. But you can't because it's an amendment to an existing okay. agreement. See, and that's why I'm saying it. See, I, I mean, I can't support this, I don't think, because I don't think there's any restriction on how long a, an RV can be on their property. And I don't think that meets even the spirit of what we're trying to do. So I'd rather wait and make sure that they come back and Ms. apply. Ms. Rosser. Ms. Peggy. It, uh, when somebody goes out there and wants to camp out, do they sign some kind of a, do they sign anything? We're, they register as a guest. And does it say on there anywhere that it, hey, you just have a 30-day limit? Does it, no? no? We oh, they talked about winter Texans. <laughs> In 2005, there was a research done by Michigan University on RV people who visited the cities. It was found they spent $160 a day in the cities that they visited, driving Class A motor homes, coming into our town, and spending money, which in turn increases our sales tax revenues. That's what we're wanting to attract. We're building an RV park. Okay. Mayor, this might assist in looking at um, the ordinance. Section 2 says that in all other respects, the property shall, shall be subject to the applicable re uh, regulations contained in Chapter 12. Well, that's what so we were So that makes sense. Right. No, that's I what, can, that's what Mr. Hirschfeld and I right. were saying. What does Chapter 12 say then? That would contain the restrictions and those would include the 30 days. Including the ordinance. Right. Because indeed, there would be many other regulations that this district would have to comply with that would not be spelled out specifically. It's okay, but Chapter 12 has the ordinance involving the 30 days of, and all that. Is yes. that correct? Yes. She just answered Paul Average. Rowe that they didn't have to comply. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, Article 3, Section 314. 1233. She's reading. 1233. Okay, so where are the 30 days? It's actually under temporary living quarters. Show me where that is. Campground recreational vehicle parks are intended for camping or recreational vehicles occupied as temporary living quarters etc and so Jeff is now telling me that the restriction of 30 days is under the temporary living quarter definition where is that under 314g 
in chapter so, 12 yes under chapter 12. okay I believe the plan development district does have reference to the ordinance and that's what I was looking for was for somebody to say it does okay okay oh, outstanding uh, I'm ready to call for a vote on this is there any, any further input or question from council is there any further public input on this item okay I'm gonna call for this vote then all those in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. any opposed nay okay I believe we have a five to one vote Okay, let's move forward then to item number 13. This is the first public hearing and consideration of introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Exhibit A of the Code of Ordinances, uh, City of San Angelo. This is zoning item 13-08 for Cho Walker and a presentation from Planner Jeff Hintz. This is Z1308, as you'd stated. This is a request for approval of a zone change from single family residential or RS1 to two family residential RS2 to allow for household living as allowed in RS2 zoning districts at 1205 South Jackson Street. This is approximately 75 feet southwest from South Jackson Street and West Avenue H. Uh, 20 notifications were sent for this particular request, three were returned in opposition. Uh, you can see the subject property here uh, within town. Live Oak Street runs through the top. Uh, you'll find uh, Sherwood Way um, slash Beauregard up here. Uh, this is in the Santa Rita area. There's several of these type situations in this area already. Um, there is some RS2 zoning in the area already, uh, about 500 feet away from this particular district. In this case, the request for RS2 zoning is on two particular lots here, lots one and two of this block. Uh, an aerial photo shows that there's an existing accessory building on the back that the applicant is looking to turn that into an accessory apartment for um, you know, the use of a relative to live in. And it would be a full service accessory apartment, so it would have a kitchen and a bathroom, which is, wh which is why this RS2 zoning is required. Um, the ordinance does not allow for two houses on a single family residential lot that are self-sufficient without RS2 zoning. Uh, the vision plan map for, the neighborhood is for this area is calling for neighborhood, indicated by the yellow here. These are the map. Uh, this is a map showing where the notifications uh, that you received in your packet that were in opposition to this particular request were. Now uh, this is looking at the subject property in the front yard here from Jackson Street. This is the house here and the accessory building is behind it there. Uh, this is looking at that um, unit in the back from the backyard at the accessory structure. Um, planning staff recommended approving this zone change. The planning commission recommended approval of it by a uh, six to zero vote at the March 18th, 2013 meeting. Um, the basis for staff's recommendation, uh, many of these single family properties do have accessory apartments in this area. In truth, you know, a whole analysis of the area probably should be done. There's several other properties that would likely, you know, benefit from this type of zoning, but um, Ms. Walker here has come in and applied for that. Um, I can go into to more if you have any other questions um, and explain our um, recommendation a little bit more if you'd like. Okay. Questions for the gentleman? Yes, I'd like for him to split the screen back so I could finish reading it <laughs> really fast. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me make sure I understand this. To have a garage apartment or whatever, it has to be RS2. It, you can have, cur currently, you can have, um, I think it dates back to the 80s. They, they called them, it was in our ordinances, in the zoning ordinance, servants' quarters until up to the 80s. The language was servants' quarters where you could have folks live. The difference um, to make this an accessory apartment would be a full kitchen. Now, some folks will have like what you'd call a mother-in-law suite where there's maybe it's missing a bathroom or it's missing a kitchen, but that really is what differentiates them. Um, this particular applicant is looking to have a full kitchen and a full bathroom, which would make this a self, you know, self-sufficient unit, and that's why the RS2 zoning is necessary. Okay, and then I guess the next thing is, uh, is this going to be a new structure in the back? No, it's an existing it's structure. Just remodeling the structure that's already there. It's Correct. It would, it would uh, legitimize and legalize a full service, you know, standalone apartment. I can go to the um, go to the picture aerial picture. Aerial there you go. Yeah, it's an existing structure that the applicant is looking to remodel. So it's basically just renovate. taking that and converting that into a residence. A, a, a full residence that, that would stand alone. It'd have a full bathroom and a full kitchen in it. As opposed to a mother. As, as opposed to a mother-in-law suite, which is missing one or the other. Okay. 
pop forward. There was something that said there are a couple of these RS2s in the immediate area. Yeah, I'll have to, to back up. Um, and uh, Ms. Johnson had worked on that. And yet you'll find one in this area here is an RS2. There's several RS2s, you know, in the in the area. There's another one over here as well. This map is, you know, blown okay. out a little that bit was further. My neighbor. This one here is about 500 feet away. Okay. Thank you. Do you all have questions for the gentleman or for the proponent? Okay, can I get a motion on this Thank item? You. A motion to approve. I'll second that. I have a motion from Mr. Hirschfeld, a second from Mr. Silvis to approve as presented. Uh, any further questions? Public input on this item. Call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, let's move forward then to item number 14. This is the first public hearing in consideration of introducing or the introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 12, Exhibit A of the Code of Ordinances. This is uh, zoning case 13-09, a.k.a. PD 07-03-2013 amendment concerning Jack Gabriel and, again, uh, Jeff Hintz. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you're not uh, growing tired of me yet. Um, oops. Z1309. Tell us, tell us a Tony Romo story and we'll let you stay up there for a little longer. Uh, I did go to high school with him. He's now a rich man. I know I don't have access to his bank account, though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Go ahead. Um, Z1309, this Jack true Gabriel. Um, true story. This is uh, Plan Development 0703. Um, this is the 2013 amendment. It was. This would allow the um, a gymnastics academy to be operated in an existing plan development zone, uh, which is approved at this time for an assisted living facility. And the applicant has come to us and sought to uh, add gymnastics academy. This is at the old Travis School, located at 2909 South A&M Avenue at the corner of South Oxford and South A&M Avenue. This is approximately an eight acre property. Uh, 21 notices were sent and one was returned in favor. Um, the background packet should have included that as well. This is just to familiarize you with the area. You can see it's in the center of town, just north of the Red Arroyo. The aerial photo will do a much better job indicating that. You can see the Arroyo cuts through here. The school's been vacant for many years. Uh, the plan development that's approved on this property for assisted living uh, back in 2007 <coughs> has never materialized. Uh, the applicant hasn't sought to take that away, but just to add you know, options to the property in terms of this. The vision plan map for the area is calling for neighborhood type development. Um, you can see here's where the one notification in favor came from. Now looking south on 8 on Avenue, you can see there's a, a playground with the school. Uh, this is the school here, the former Travis Elementary School. Looking west at the property, you can see uh, it's, it's been closed for some time. The sign is still there as well. Um, and this is the gymnasium where the gymnastics academy is going to be uh, utilized in the future here. And looking southwest again, you can see out to the Red Arroyo as well. Uh, it's a pretty you know expansive area. This this happens to be eight acres under private can, ownership. Can I speak? Could you? Hang on. He's well, I mean, do we want to keep going? We okay, you'd like to go ahead see, and... See, I think I can make a motion to approve... And I can second. And I'll just say that this is uh, tumbleweed gymnastics, and it looks just like that Travis Elementary has come back alive and in session. And my grandma, three houses away, was notified. And I said, hey, did you, you know, did you recognize what was going on? She had no idea that they were in trouble, got thrown out, and having troubles. She said, it looks fine. It'll work. And it does. It works with the neighborhood. There's nobody in opposition. Conditions. It, it looks really good. And that's why I, I recommend approval. I got it. I got the motion in the second. I do want to see the conditions. The and then I have a comment. Okay. Sure. Under the draft ordinance, uh, it's got this, this, you know, the standard language, sections one and two. If you violate this, you're guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, section five is really where it gets into the uses. Uh, and I'm sorry, there's no slide for this, but I'll read off the draft that was included in the packet. Um, the underlying zoning on this was already RS1 with the... Um, approved assisted living but in terms of this this property shall not allow any retail sales we really didn't see the traffic network back there you know if someone wanted to run a store out of that really wouldn't be appropriate uh, we did find that um, retail sales for folks attending the academy or you know types of gymnastics you know leotards and things like that that type of retail sales would be allowed under this but inviting folks in to sell them these types of it you know it would not be allowed um, office space would be allowed at the gymnastics academy and for the assisted group living facility there's you know conceivable need for some some of these folks that have an office to run their business out of there so that would be allowed under this as well but only an office for the gymnastics academy uh, the applicant had come to us and only indicated they'd like to run a gymnastics academy there's no other uses they'd like to do um, we've also built in an appeals project uh, process that if someone you know comes and says we'd like to do you know x y or z there if the planning managers 
interpretation is not agreeable to that could be appealed to our zoning board of adjustment for a final say um, we, we use the standard parking requirements that are required for gymnasiums and other types of things in other parts of town that's included in this ordinance uh, then we went ahead and added in uh, a change of occupancy is needed on the building there is some permitting issues with you know the, the space hasn't been evaluated yet to see if it was safe or not yet so a change of occupancy needs to occur before this use can move in there to ensure the building is safe has a proper amount of bathrooms that type of thing and the last one is just that outdoor storage of materials would not be allowed on the site um, you know given that it is near the neighborhood this isn't a spot for folks to store things outside okay motion in a second recognize miss farmer could you back up to the pictures please up until this year this was in my district and for ever since the school closed and the individuals bought this as a private property the residents in the area it's been one complaint after another if it were mowing the weeds uh, they changed the water lines and they jackhammered up part of the city's the part the sidewalk and the city went out and told them they had to replace or you know repair their idea to repair was to put a piece of plywood with two cinder blocks over each end which people that walked on the sidewalks in the area tripped over or various things uh, if you'll back up to a little bit further on the pictures you'll see s some sea containers as well as horse trailers fifth wheelers six wheel I mean storage of all kinds of outside equipment and has been a constant complaint of the people in the area for a number of years just wanted to add that in there I don't have any problems with the gymnastic and the girls to the Texas tumbleweed it's a great organization I, I do have a problem with getting control over this property owner to adhere to the city ordinances with reference to keeping it clean picked up no outside storage of containers and uh, extra horse trailers and cetera and so forth if you'll go to the next picture you'll you'll see what I'm uh, they no, it's further back there in in the back right there in fuel, full view and over to the side will start to see containers uh, add that bit of history because it was in my district for a number of years I will say um, you know, my first learning experiences with the city when I started a few months um, you know not a few months ago but back when I started about two years ago um, was this particular property um, finding out for myself and the ordinances in town here that uh, sea containers are not allowed in any residential district which the underlying zoning of this is a residential district um, I can't speak for code and mr. Flores but I have worked with code in the past on this particular property regarding violations uh, it appears there may be more so we'll certainly handle that and try to get that cleaned up since that is a zoning violation with those types of things there it sure helps when they have a revenue source <laughs> then they can actually fix things and pay for the mowing you got to have a revenue source and they've got to be in business over here so that'll help okay so I have a motion and a second I have a comment I need uh, to know if I have other uh, other comments from from council questions okay I just want to make sure I'm reading through the PD that uh, the only thing that is allowed in these buildings via this PD is gymnastics academy and assisted group living, correct? Correct. All right. I just want to make sure Changes that, to no that retail sales developed. other than uh, yeah. inside to the gymnastics showcases and to or clients. events. Right, like a concession stand or, you know, clothing for gymnastics okay, and no invitation of, you know, no signs out front. We've got you assisted know, a concession living stand. Never been developed. Correct. Okay. It, it would still be allowed to, or this wouldn't take that away. It would leave that the property a little more versatile in that regard. It would just, you know, add to it. We didn't Maybe find those uses would gymnastics. conflict. So, are we taking away RS1? No, the RS1, it's still going to be zoned PD. Um, mo most PDs will have an underlying zoning, uh, at least the ones that I've had a chance to work on, just in case, you know, we'll try to get everything we can, but in case we've forgotten something, there needs to be a a fallback of some type um, the last one didn't unfortunately but it kind of did through the zoning ordinance but um, the most of the ones you'll see that have been recent will have an underlying zoning of some kind so the RS1 the property isn't actually zoned that but if for some reason something was forgotten or left out we would look at RS1 regulations and that would apply okay I'm gonna call for this vote all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. any opposed no public comment okay. um, it is. Uh, I, it, I did drop the ball that I did not allow public comment. And so would somebody like to come up and comment on this? Uh, I'll be glad to call for the vote again. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Farmer. Is Jack or Landa here? Is, is, or is Jack here? No? Landa? No? 
Okay. Do we okay, need Okay, 15. Uh, I have 15, and then we did 16 and 17. I have a request that we take a little break. So, uh, okay. I'll, uh, here we go for a small break, and then we'll come back. And we'll be on item number 15. Tiny black. Okay, let's move on then to item number, do I have a quorum? One, two, three, I do. Uh, uh, we'll move on to item number 15. This is the first public hearing in consideration of introduction of an ordinance uh, related to zoning item 13-10, the Mills development. Uh, good afternoon. This is my last item, unless you have a random thing for me. Um, this is Mills Development Incorporated. Uh, this is approval of a zone, a request for approval of a zone change from ranch and estate to single family residential. Uh, if you me, look back to this that, is what we uh, annexed. This recently. is what was annexed on March fifth. This is the property subject to that. Uh, by default, three thirteen B of the zoning ordinance, um, not three thirteen, three o three A. I think it is of the zoning ordinance. Every newly annexed property into the city limits by default is zoned ranch and estate, so this is them coming, you know, to get the type of zoning that they would like on their property. Well, then it can I make a motion to approve? Second. I have a motion to approve from Mr. Hirschfeld. I believe I heard Ms. Farmer uh, as the second. And so do we have questions on this item? Do you want that at 10,000 feet or 20,000 <laughs> feet? What? Okay, outstanding. All right, I have a motion and a second uh, to move forward on this item as nearly presented. Uh, <laughs> do I have any public comment on this item? Do I have any further comments from council? Let me call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Did you notice that after you told them about your relationship with Tony Romo, things are moving right along? I like you a whole lot more. Okay. Okay. How we do it? <laughs> Item number 18. This is the discussion of costs related to the Texas Municipal Retirement System cost of living uh, adjustment increase. And so it is a discussion item. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. We had talked previously about uh, uh, what it costs to change our TMRS benefits package from a 50% COLA benefit to a 70%. We had previously been on 70%, and uh, as TMRS was uh, revamping its uh, actuarial uh, assumptions, the rates were climbing, and uh, in an effort to stem that tied we moved from a 70 percent cola benefit to a 50 percent cola benefit uh, i think all the participants would be in favor of moving to 70 percent at some point today would be okay but uh, that's not what's in front of you but any time in the future but uh, there uh, is question about what it would take to do that the answer is approximately one million dollars per year in additional payroll costs uh, and that covers all employees all full-time employees except for the fire department which have their own pension no system mr. mayor I had asked Michael to uh, bring this back for us to discuss because we had promised the retirees that we would look at it and after the first of the year tell them what the conclusion was that we more than likely could not act or approve on anything till budget time but this is why I asked him to bring it back so we could talk about what it actually would cost the city to do a change and that's what I needed to know. Okay. Well, it's a discussion item, so I want to walk through some things. When you read through the information, it basically talks about a 7% contribution by the employee and a 14% contribution by the uh, by, by the city, and but we're at 19%, okay, and we've been up based on the actuarial problems and then a, a uh, an adoption by the council really in about 2008 uh, that that I remember when you discussed all those things, Mr. Dane. I wasn't here. I wasn't here, but I was out there. And um, and is that kind of slowly moving back down from, or is it the same at the 18.93, or what is the what is it, that? It is roughly the same. Okay. And uh, as as act as a, as actual experience uh, related to 
assumed experience occurs, whether we have better than assumed experience, that could bring the rate down, or if we have worse than assumed or projected experience, that would tend, have a tendency to push the rates up. But right now, TMRS uh, has advised us that we can expect approximately this rate for the foreseeable future. Uh, what has caused this elevated rate over an extended period is a fixed uh, um, amortization of a liability which they determined to exist a few years back when they were going through this issue. At one point, we talked about our the city's contribution rate being 19 percent. At one point, we were looking at the possibility of a contribu contribution rate between 24 and 27 percent for that benefits package. And so uh, TMRS made some changes at the uh, state level, some statu statutory changes, uh, which helped bring that rate down. And on our side, we were active in that we began to bring that benefit level down. We didn't feel like rates that high were sustainable over the long also you, yes sir also the the employee part though at seven percent has stayed the same right yes sir and that is by statute not a variable type item okay and so there you go that's where i was headed and so i was wondering if uh if there was an ability for the council to say we'd like the employees to go to nine percent and we'll go f instead of from 19 to 22 we'll go to 21 or whatever but you said just then that that is not a variable that's that's true and and I probably should clarify I think if this council for, for example in setting pay benchmarks what do we want to pay compared to other cities cities we view as comparable we might set that benchmark artificially low by whatever we feel like employees should contribute to TMRS for example if we were going to pay dollar for dollar what a comparable city would pay instead of paying an employee a hundred dollars we might say, well, we're going to pay you 98 and the other two is going to go as your contribution to TMRS. Uh, so there are ways, while formally employees don't contribute more than 7%, to the extent that that overage we pay, that the city pays for TMRS, uh, affects what is available to pay an employee, then to that extent employees are paying more. Uh -huh. I was. I was going to see how that could be parsed as it related to someone that's uh, 65 years or older and is an is a retired employee and uh, some you know what I'm saying I was going uh, someone that's a brand new employee comes in at a different uh, in a different position than somebody that's been here for a while and I so that's what I was about to start pursuing was could you treat different people differently uh, but raise the rate on some and so forth to 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 do this together uh, but the answer is not really that that's true in fact not at all because those rules are set at the state level and that is not a feature that is allowed in those rules um, TMRS wrestled with this I'm on, on an advisory committee which uh, is charged with researching and contemplating issues for the board and the number one issue was how to deal with COLA there are cities out there that never had it uh, that feel they should have it. There are cities out there like us who had it at the 70 percent level and either did away with it or reduced it and would like to get back where they were, but the cost is very high. And so uh, in addition to that, the way the computation is outlined in the state statutes, the move we took, which appears to be a very prudent move on the surface, disproportionately affects retirees based on how long they've been retired. The people who need the COLA adjustment the most are hurt the most and by no these kind of no actions. there's no ability to be variable in that. That's correct. There's no variability there also. And so that was one of the things the advisory committee looked into was what should we do? And uh, we gave the board some options. Uh, and one of the options was to do nothing to simply t TMRS relative to other state level systems is in in good shape and uh, but there is a concerted effort by groups out there to attack systems which are not simply cash based TMRS is a hybrid uh, system with a 
an element of uh, defined benefit and an element of cash basis or defined contribution. Uh, so it is considered a hybrid system. But there are systems out there that are uh, in difficulty, particularly in other states that we see in the newspaper. But there are systems in Texas which are in not as good a shape as TMRS, and they may be targeted for legislative proposals. And uh, I think the TMRS boards position this year was to take no action uh, on making COLA changes this year, but simply to, uh, uh, to try to educate citizens, taxpayers, and legislators that TMRS is uh, in relatively good shape compared to these others. So as far as TMRS being advocates for legislation, that's not happening this year. Um. So the f I'm sorry, Mayor. In summary, the flexibility that you would want to consider as potential solutions just uh, is not there at this point. Yeah. Is there? Is it circumventing that, or is it a problem? If you wanted to give a stipend to certain people uh, without including everybody, seems like that's probably considered circumventing the. Well, the we would do that outside of the TMRS system. And we, what we would have to determine through some assistance from legal would be uh, under what conditions are we able to pay people who don't work for us and um, who have not provided service or goods to us. And, and we would need to, that would be a, qu a question okay. we would pose anyway, to legal. I, and I bring that up for folks on council to consider as a way of helping somebody uh, where, you're, where you might leave the 50% COLA level, but try to look at a way where you felt like if there was a subgroup you really wanted to help, maybe you would look for a way to stipend that subgroup instead of helping everybody. Here or there, I that, just... Well, but that does make some sense because then you're directly targeting, those putting your finger hurt, right on the problem. Those people who were hurt the most, maybe you go, look, how do we fix their problem without spending a million bucks on everybody? Exactly. Uh, and so, you, you know, that's what I was looking for is how do you spend two hundred thousand dollars fixing the problem and well and is it so is is it the ones that have been retired a certain number of years or what is that it, it is in general it is the longer you've been retired the longer it will be before you get a uh, an addition a cola adjustment an upward adjustment of your annuity under this situation and that's sad I mean those guys you know it's it is rooted in the method of calculation that is uh, in the state statutes which uh, enable that COLA. And that was at the heart of the discussion is, should we allow cities to, should, should we be advocates for legislation which would allow cities to give one-time COLAs? The problem is if I pledge to pay an individual one dollar more per year than I've set aside for them, it doesn't just cost me a dollar, it costs me a dollar every year and there's a present value impact of that. You bet. And so uh, TMR, the board chose not to move ahead with those, but the, certainly the COLA discussion is not going to go away. And I would think from our standpoint, some kind of a targeted approach might be the best way uh, in the short term. In the long term, though, which is very much the view you want for, for managing a pension. I mean, you got to manage this year's expense, but you also want to set goals. What is it we want? our benefit to be related to pensions right. and to that end I would suggest that if council wants something different or at least wants to be considered our level of pay and benefits then probably you should direct staff to make it something that we make it a priority not necessarily that an out particular outcome is a priority but that it be studied and so okay. uh, where we ended last time was that we would, this would come up in our strategic planning discussions, but it never came up. We were very much focused on those other priorities, and we didn't get to the level where we were managing the organization. Right. So if you want to direct staff to put it on that, to, on that list, now would well, be that's a up great to, time. That's, you know, there's certainly a group here. F for me, 19% is as big a number as I'm willing to swallow. So, but anyway, that's up, up to the group what kind of consensus there is and what you want to tell him. 
I wish I want you to find a way to pinpoint those people who are harmed the most and and spend some money against those people that's what I would like to see us do so there's a group of people that have been retired that that this impacts in an inordinate way and I'd like to figure out how to how to focus on that group of people and try to help them so. an alternative might be to impact those folks through the insurance rates right and so yeah and so you provide something that's a benefit over here to offset the fact that you're not getting everything you might have over there anyway that's my own opinion is that we ought to be trying to fix the problem not not increase the overall expense myself I'd, you're going to have some real challenges because of streets and because of a police department building and because of et cetera. and so it's just going to be hard to do to be all things to all people so 19 percent when you're supposed to be spending 14 percent for me is all of the bite that I would take but that's I'm not you know I'm not the only one here so anything else we want to tell him while we're in Remind discussion me again how many people we have under the retirement system now we the city how many people are out there it'd be approximately well uh, how many employees we have how under many employees this have system retired retired employees do we have out there I think we have in the neighborhood of 800 retirees I think we have approximately 400 I don't know that. Lisa would know that. I for every 1% right. increase. Pardon me? $300,000 for every 1% per increase, more or less? Approximately. That's true. 800 retirees. <laughs> We're a city which uh, has been established for a long period of time. Newer cities, like smaller cities in the Metroplex, which haven't been around long, have had fewer issues with this because they simply haven't had long-term employees. But the city of San Angelo has been in existence and a member of TMRS for a long period of time. And so we have, we're a mature city from that standpoint. I understand the hardships and the heartaches that we go through each year at budget time, but I also understand the hardships that the retirees go through when they see less and less brought home to feed their family or pay their electric bills. And uh, for retirees that are truly retired, they're not working at another job, that that's their only source of income. Uh, I would like to see between now and budget if you and Daniel and maybe a council member could really work on a proposal to, uh, we can't do this until January of next year, If I, is that correct? We can't put it into place, a COLA change for it to be effective to that retiree till January 1 of the following year. I think you're right. I think that is correct. So it's something that we've worked on it. We found out what it's going to cost us, but what we can recommend and how we can pay for an increase in the budget. Well, again, remember, that's what it costs you to, to impact every employee and every retiree. Mm -hmm. So a way of making the bite smaller is just affecting a subgroup, just the retirees. Or anyway, I just give you that to I've, think about. That's that's. What I would like to do, if, if Daniel could find a way in our budget process to pay for this, but Daniel and Michael, but I want to give them something with this outgoing council. We, you know, we've been working on this, and this is there, and this is what we now know that it will cost. And if uh, something can be brought in and put in place and recommended. Okay when we're at budgets we'll now uh, something for you to consider is that there are retirees who received an adjustment but they didn't receive the adjustment they would have received if we'd been at 70 percent so they received a smaller adjustment so we have really a population of retirees and then we have subgroups who are affected at different levels right and and i would uh, approach this, this complicated prop Process. Probably with those affected the greatest would be first in line for some sort of an adjustment Relief. or assistance. All right. All right. Mr. I, Morrison. And I would also ask to uh, echo what Charlotte has said. And if we can't give them any more, if we, I would like to tie it in with the insurance. If we can, if we can't give them an, an increase in their in their monthly salary if we could take an amount off of what we charge them in insurance it's that all balances out but i would like for y'all also to look at this very very closely and let's see if we can get some relief especially for these that's been retired for some time and under a different economic situation yeah. well i think 
that was an idea you thought of while ago, and I think that might have real merit. So that would be something for you guys to pursue as a, a way to go after a fix. Is there anything else before I ask for public comment? For those who don't have insurance, take the insurance. I think, I think that's, that's an interesting thought and interesting idea on that. I've, I've got concerns on how that particular idea can pull together and actually uh, work and be legal. Okay. I've got real concerns on that, but I'm not trying to tell you it won't work. I just okay. have concerns. Sometimes legality, we use, we do take into Sometimes account. Sometimes that creates a real roadblock, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It an, interferes with creativity on a frequent basis. Public input. <laughs> Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I appreciate y'all bringing this to the forefront. Um, I'm Russell Smith, retired police chief. Uh, several, uh, some time ago when the checks started coming out and TMRS notified people, I received notice that a 2003 employee had received a pay raise and I received that notice from somebody that had not, who was older, uh, been retired longer, didn't work under a competitive play plan. Uh, and to me, that's the one thing that it's hard for y'all to understand because most of you weren't here. The city didn't pay anything competitive back during the time of these other employees, so their retirement benefit is already 40 to 50 percent below what it would have been if it had been competitive to the cities that you are, you know, you compare yourselves against now. So you've got people getting raises that have just recently retired, but these people that are making these real low annuities aren't getting any adjustment at all. And the question that I had for you then and I have for you now, even though I understand the deal with TMRS, I have been through an educational process on that 20 years ago. Actually, it was 1981, so it's been a while. But is it fair? Is it fair that you pay employees a competitive pay raise and now the retirement system is, and y'all are giving them raises to their recent deal but the ones that are hurt the most and have been hurt dramatically, again, not only by this, but by the health care. And many of us losing the pharmacy really hurt us too, but, but is it fair? So I know the, about the money and I understand it. I understand that. And I hope you can look to one of these other solutions. I did ask someone over 65 what uh, their insurance costs is $16, whatever it is that they're paying a month and that that is the only cost they have on the insurance but remember before we didn't have any and all that's been added and has hurt the retirees especially these older retirees that are now asking why are why do they get raises and we don't they don't and I understand the big picture I don't like it but anyway and I appreciate Miss Farmer for bringing this up so thank y'all I mean I've been here before y'all Y'all know where I'm at, so without a doubt. So anyway, thank y'all. Thank you. Okay. Other public comment? Okay. Mr. Dane, it was a discussion item. I'm going to move us to the next item. This is a discussion on amending the ordinance related to growth restrictions uh, concerning weeds and vegetation. And we have a, a request from our council member Farmer and a presentation by our code compliance manager, Mr. Flores. Ms. Farmer, would you like to carry the day, please? Yes, this brings me back to uh, the time when uh, Shane uh, was speaking before us and telling us that we uh, were granting them not to have to mow, and I had a knee-jerk reaction, you know, what's good for the gander is good for the goose. If, if the city's going to be exempt, why are we making our commercial builders out there, the ones who are helping this city, paying taxes to this city and making it grow, why are they being penalized when the city's getting a free ride? So I went to Daniel about it, talked to him, and got with James Flores, and had several meetings with uh, some of the builders representing. And with reference to an area of 10 acres or more, I had a particular person in my district that his mowing bill for the month for, I forget the number of acreage, but his mowing bill was $88,000. and I had a heart attack. I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of acreage and that's a lot of mowing in an area that was once cleared 10, 15 years ago. 
there had not been any development. We've been in a decline area, and I just cannot see penalizing any business owner to make them mow and keep up. Now, I'm not saying let it go, but when we're in stormwater conservation and we have learned that letting some of that grass grow helps prevent runoff, that I felt like it was time that we relooked at the amendment that required uh, builders to mow uh, to that excess and ask James to meet with them and that's been done and I'll turn it back over to James Good afternoon mayor council city staff uh, As councilwoman farmer stated we did uh, work on this start late October into November um, And we basically just had a couple of meetings of uh, Opinion gathering I guess the ordinance was already established and uh, obviously we were enforcing it as written so uh, We got we gathered tons of information different opinions um, and we, we kind of come to a conclusion where I think um, we left 95, 98 percent of the original ordinance intact, um, added an affirmative defense uh, to this particular issue without circumventing the intent of the ordinance. And what I mean by that is uh, we, we, we decided to add an affirmative defense of 10 acres or more. That would be an exemption to this having to mow with the exception of being able to cut or having to cut 100 feet from the nearest structure or 15 feet from the curb and we went 10 acres because in our uh, northern districts there is five acres six acre tracks that people live on um, that we felt you know uh, are are manageable and, and should be maintained or a butt right up next to an, uh, a bona fide rs1 district so again i think the uh, uh, what we did the conclusion area of, of that meeting was to add the amendment to um, the current ordinance and it specifically states uh, any track or parcel of land that is 10 acres or more whether or not previously disturbed from its vegetative state can be allowed to go back to its original state so being the grass weeds are 15 feet from the curb and 100 feet from the nearest structure um, again today if you go by a 50 acre track and you clear it because you have these big hopes of doing something with it and then something doesn't happen uh, you have to maintain that 50 acre tract um, under the proposed uh, affirmative defense for that type of situation um, you would be al allowed to let it go back to its vegetative state so being you're 100 feet off the nearest structure structure can be a fence it could be an accessory building um, a lot of discussion came out of what a structure was is it, it, it rather comical but uh, anyway a fence is, is a structure um, and or 15 feet off the curb so I, again I think with this uh, with this proposal, we uh, we kept the ordinance intact, we kept the integrity and the intent of the ordinance, and we allowed an affirmative defense that makes sense for people that have 10 acres or more uh, tracts of land. Okay, questions for him? Motion? I'll make a motion to approve as requested. Second. Motion uh, and second to approve as presented. Any further questions from council? Okay, do I have public comment on this item? Call for this vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That uh, passes. Let's move on to item number 21. This is consideration of approving various board nominations by council and designated council members. Uh, Go ahead, sir. Okay. And uh, we're tabling 21B, so we're only voting on 21A. This is the Design and Historic Review Commission. Uh, motion to approve second. 21A. Okay, I have a motion and a second on 21A on Mr. Smith. Uh, any any other input? Call for that vote. Uh, all for those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Item number 22, consideration of approving a Civil Service Commission nomination for Keith Hidalgo by the city manager. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve uh, this nomination. Any questions or comments? Okay, call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, announcements and consideration of future agenda items. Uh, I, have, uh, a I have a desire to be uh, informed on any progress we've made on the reclamation of water. There's, you remember that we talked about the using treated water, trying to get it to the Texas Sports Bank complex possibly, and looking at options for it. And uh, I'd like an update on 
what's being done has been done is it has it dropped off the radar screen what's going on with it on uh, reclaimed water and so I need to know what's going on there any other items folks yes miss farmer uh, I would like a uh, item with reference to the meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago with the uh, Lake Nasworthy folks with reference to the leases and the determination I had asked uh, Michael to get me the factor of that calculation so maybe he and I and Alicia could review it and make a recommendation to council with references to if anything should be done to amend um, that proposal of the purchase the, the percentage if they have not proposed it and I would like I, oh not on hmm, okay I would like for that to to get rolling since it's been a couple of months since we met with those folks uh, when I say we, I'm talking of myself, the mayor, and Mr. Alexander. Uh, also, uh, about nine months or so ago, uh, we met, uh, meaning we, Mr. Hirschfield and Rick, I believe, uh, with some firemen about a proposal, a plan that they had come up with with reference to salaries and whatnot. And that's been about nine months ago, and we truly, in all fairness should get back on and follow up on and I would like something of a permanent committee or whatnot to look at that and get that looked at before July rolls around that when we're ready for budget time I can budget. And just as an update we've had some meetings on that and currently one last week even so oh. we haven't been I, I really need that uh, settled also I have not been uh, comfortable with and it may, it's not too late I really would like to revisit the issue of our Hickory Water D radium plant I am more and more uncomfortable with that particular building or process being right here in the city limits and so close to our river our water source and the possibility of having that building located outside the city limits on some city land is more favorable to me than it going in after Mr. Uh, the gentleman who spoke with us last uh, uh, council meeting I'm uncomfortable with it Hutch thank you I'm just uncomfortable with that I really would like to revisit it um, I'm still not crazy totally 100% of the Hickory water source uh, other sources may or may not be out there there I know that we've been looking at other places and I, I want to talk about that and get the ball moving and not just concentrate on the Hickory I think our citizens are due um, more information and more choices out there and I want to bring it to the table and talk about it I'm going to quote the mayor as he just earlier self they won't be dealt with unless they're brought to the table and talked about so <laughs> gotcha well, that's, um, all right. that's okay uh, but I really would like to talk about those and I also would like to request that if I could be assigned with a committee to work with maybe Miss Bolin and one other with reference to uh, our boards our various boards and their bylaws some of them don't even have bylaws and I, I think that's a dangerous territory and I, I would like for us to get working on that one in particular uh, that doesn't have any bylaws or some recent maybe boards that were organized or maybe combined and they don't have a new set of bylaws um, but I would like to work with her and get something going on that and also the uh, language that we talked about when we went back from drought stage three and dropped all the way to drought stage one uh, has never been done we've never looked at that and talked at it and I would like to be publicly made responsible to work with Miss Bowling and get the rewriting of that language and brought to and before council in a quick manner we just some lacking things out there that we've not done and then I've had some phone calls and requests about reference to the unsafety out at South Chadburn and Cristobal Road how dark it is out there no lighting and possibly what it would take or get done to get some lighting out there I asked about three years ago that we have lighting all the way to the airport on Knickerbocker Road and was told it was something that engineering would look at never came back never looked at it one of those never never that I felt like I was ignored and to me it's a safety issue I know it's a cost issue as well but citizen requested that we look for possible lights in uh, Mr. Silvis's district there on Chadburn and uh, Cristobal Road because it's high rate of speed area oh what else um, isn't that enough Charlotte 
Let's that was see. enough. That was enough for a couple of meetings. Oh well, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is what happens when you can't walk or drive, <laughs> exactly. and you you have to <laughs> lay in bed or sit around and read and think of all kinds of things exactly. to do. So y'all please Very pray nice. for me that I get back <laughs> on my feet real soon. I think we all. Do. No, we'll pray <laughs> for us. we need to pray for us, right? <laughs> but uh, I would like to see that those things get done before our May changing of the guards, as I call it. Uh, it may not be get completed, but at least it would be in more process than it is right now. Okay. I'll shut up. I got one. Okay, Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, speaking of uh, the boards and commissions, I'd like to have on the next agenda, I'd like for uh, Alicia to have, to get an update on the status of boards uh, and attendance. attendance not making quorums uh, we need to we need to hit that front and center because that's that truly is unacceptable and and um, we need to bring that front and center okay others I've got a couple of things that have been brought to my attention that okay mr. Silvis uh, along the river there are some dead trees and are they going to be cut down and also there's one big stump out there it's a tree that was broken and there's nothing but spikes sticking out along uh, right there adjacent to Santa Fe Park. There's nothing but spikes. Uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm very still very much interested in even having Shane Kelton or myself uh, be in touch again with Tracy Kane at TxDOT because I'm still interested in wanting to clean up that Loop 306 entrances, exits. You it's know, I bad. It, it is bad. And... Uh, so if you want to put a bug in Tracy's ear and let me know, I, I'd love to. He said he was going to talk to some folks about it, and uh, I, I have yet to hear back from him, Shane. So if you could help me out, I'm still very much interested because there's folks out there that are wanting to help out groups. Thank you. Others? I have just one more thing I was looking at the <laughs> list here. Can't, can't, don't cut me off yet. Uh, in visiting with uh, a citizen here, and, and I believe Michael was there when I was talking to him, there's a, a piece of land that sits uh, just to the west of the Christian Village and just behind the old Safeway building, which is the uh, Big Lots, old Big Lots now. But that piece of land that's got that drainage ditch down between it, uh, the Christian Village has missed uh, two or three sales of being able to sell that land because of that drainage ditch and its curative state and who's going to cure it. Uh, Clinton Bailey, I believe, looked at and couldn't find any record of how it came to be, and I vaguely remember some stuff, but I really would like for engineering to look at that and bring it back and see what resolution that we can do. And, and Michael, you know, because you were there on that conversation. Yes, ma'am. Clinton prepared a memo for me, and I just forwarded copies ask for copies to be forwarded to you and to that citizen and um, if you get that and you'd like some more follow-up we're certainly available yeah, that's one of those that used to be in my district and now it's in his so we can hold him responsible yes. for that now <laughs> okay and then if Mr. Valenzuela could give us an update, please, on how the uh, Water Department opened that Saturday to address problems. I've not heard any oh, okay. reports as to how it went, or um, are we having more days? Or Okay. Okay. Thank you. Boy, I've used up my quota for <laughs> a long time. <laughs> okay. Others? i just like to point out that I didn't say one thing. <laughs> How could Motion you? to adjourn. <laughs> now, what was I seconding that he didn't? Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going there, Paul. <laughs> well, motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>